All right, hi everybody. Um, so this is our fifth AMA, um, and we are very lucky to have Miles um, joining us today. Uh, so just a little bit about the format. Um, we're gonna go over. Uh, sorry, we're gonna go over. Um, uh, Miles is gonna do a brief overview of um, kind of like misconceptions and his thoughts on. Um, uh, the entomology field, um, and then we'll move to uh, the Q and A, um, which will be um, with the questions that were populated before the before we started. Um, I'll be reading them, and uh, Miles will be answering um, in 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 order, roughly. Um, I might pick and choose a little bit, um, and if you guys have like tangential questions. This is going to be a little bit more informal than the previous ones, um, especially because the audience for this is a little bit younger um, than our previous topics. Um, uh, people people that like aren't in college yet or um, kind of feel like entomology is an unapproachable field um, because I mean like how many of you really know entomologists, right? Um, so uh, it'll be a little bit more casual. Um, uh, Noable will be uh, checking uh, AMA voice text. If you have questions there, he might hop in um, and um, interject a question that's related to whatever's being talked about. Uh, and then uh, once we're once we're done with those uh, the the AMA questions um, that were already done beforehand, um, it'll be a more casual Q and A kind of setting. And um, if any of the previous ones are anything to go off of this. This will run for maybe an hour, um, uh, hour and a half to two hours or so. So, uh, yeah, I think, uh, Miles, you there? Yep. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. I guess they can't tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can, they can, they can respond in, uh, AMA voice text. Um, and there are a okay. few people that already have the role. Um, okay. So the reason that we picked this topic, um, was uh kind of what i said before is uh we have a lot of a lot of um younger members in the community where being an entomologist and studying ants for a living um is like a pipe dream like it's it's like it's it seems unapproachable because um i, I don't know if i just said this but like how many of you have actually met an entomologist like in person it's it's it seems like it's 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 just not something that people are really familiar with. So the idea is that we kind of want to break down the barrier here and kind of show that it's not like impossible. Um, and also like um, talk about the path and expectations and, and all that. Um, and the, the whole reason that we can, I just want to say this, the whole reason that we can even do these AMAs in the first place um, is because of um, how we have the server set up um, so that we can attract um, this kind of interest, um, we uh, we try and keep the, the the tone on the server a little bit more mature, and we try very hard to be respectful of the laws and um, conservation efforts um, in general um, around the hobby and around and in regarding entomology in general. Um, so I'm I'm really glad that uh, Miles is willing to join us for this and um, hopefully we can have um, a really good AMA this time around. Uh, so before we before Miles goes into his introduction, I'm going to move some people down. I don't know if that's making noise for other people. Um, and uh, we've got 30 in the channel and I think we're good to start. Uh, Miles? All right. Um, I'm just making sure everybody's moved over. <laughs> all right, everyone. So first of all, thank you so much for joining us for this AMA. We've had some pretty successful AMAs in the past, and I definitely think this one has the potential to be one of our best yet. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this topic. It's one I get asked about a lot, but it's not one that I actually get to discuss in detail very often. 
Um, and it's one of those things that you actually kind of have to talk through with people rather than put a couple lines in a chat room and really be able to convey um, these kinds of topics. They're, they're fairly complicated at times. So I'm really excited to be able to tackle this. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background about who I am, what I've done, um, kind of the, the path that I took to get to this point. But uh, I want to move into those questions as soon as possible. So I started Keeping Ants about 10 years ago. Um, started with a carpenter ant queen and uh, found her out walking around. Thought, okay, it'd be really cool to keep an ant colony. And then I joined some online forums and learned as I went. Um, there were an incredible number of mistakes that I made along the way of doing that. Um, and that has definitely made me not only a better ant keeper, but also a better entomologist. Um, so I'm actually going to go back to the very beginning. So in second grade, I actually sat on an ant colony. Um, I don't know what it was, but I think it was Myrmica, um, <laughs> on the playground <laughs> and they ran up my legs and stung me everywhere. And now second grade would be like second year of schooling, um, for those non-American, uh, people. And basically, they ran up my legs, stung me everywhere, freaked me out a whole bunch. And I'd always loved animals, always really admired Steve Irwin, but ants became sort of my enemy. Yeah, so early primary school, ants sort of became my enemy. And as you can imagine, I got stung everywhere, ran over to the playground supervisor who took all of my clothes off except for my underwear, and about 300 kids surrounded me on the playground laughing and watching me scream and get stung. All right, so this is uh, a good way to not like ants, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and I didn't like ants for many years. And then sixth grade came along, so that's basically the end of primary school or the beginning of what we call middle school here in the United States. And we had a teacher, and our teacher gave us the opportunity to learn about something that we said we didn't like. And at the end of that research project, we had to justify whether or not it was reasonable for us not to like that thing, or if our preconceptions were mistaken, they were misplaced. Um, so I got a Uncle Milton's ant farm, and it turns out ants are wicked cool, and I've been working to build a career not only as an ant keeper, but also as a biologist and as an entomologist. So that's really how I got started with it. Um, there were a couple of really big breakthroughs in that. I really kept going with the uh, middle school would be sixth grade uh, through eighth grade. Um, but I really kept going with my ant studies, kept many species. Over the years, I've probably kept about 100 different species of ants, um, hundreds of colonies for sure, um, and really started getting involved in some of the ant research uh, community. So through that process, I got to start learning, uh, meeting people mostly online, sort of like this sort of thing. Um, in the earlier days of Facebook, things were a little bit clunkier. Um, and I met a professor named Ann Mayo. And some of you may be familiar with her work with Pogona Mermex in Texas. Oh, looks like we're having some Yeah, just a second. Issues. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to open up the channel so people can join really quick. You know, this is this is a more casual AMA, um, so maybe we can just leave the channel unlocked for now. Do you have the join and leave um, sounds turned off, Miles? I do. It, it okay. makes the sound every time someone comes in. Oh, okay. Um, here, I'll post a screenshot of how to turn it. All right, guys, we'll get this sorted out. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. 
it can't can't be can't be like simple and straightforward. It has to have to run into problems. We were people were um, joining the join here to be moved channel, um, and when we moved them down, it would kick them for whatever reason. Okay, I'm pretty sure I got those. All right, deactivated. cool, cool, cool. Okay, All we can right. continue. Yeah. So back to it. So this is going to be very early high school um, is where we're at at this point. Uh, fairly kind of accomplished ant keeper starting to think more academically about insects. So I get in um, contact with Dr. Ann Mayo, who was familiar with my work with ant keeping. And I had done a lot of work helping universities understand how to keep ants. Um, and she said, hey, there's this course about ants that I really think you should go to. And it turned out it was the Ants of the Southwest course, which is hosted by the American Museum of Natural History at the Southwestern Research Station. So the Ants of the Southwest course is a little bit different from what you would hear about with Ant course. Ant course is run by the California Academy of Sciences and Dr. Brian Fisher and a conglomerate of other myrmecologists. But this is a different course. It's sort of a sister course that focuses more on ant behavior, uh, more on kind of basic biology, nuptial flights, how to collect ants. Whereas ant course goes over those things, but it's also a lot more focused on taxonomy, um, genetics, uh, a lot more kind of higher level academic topics than the Ants of the Southwest course. So I hop on the website and think, okay, this looks really cool. And I apply for the Ants of the Southwest course. Um, yes, Ants of the Southwest is still a thing, but there have been some issues in years recently, and there will not be one this year uh, due to uh, the situation that we're all facing. So anyway, um, Ants of the Southwest is going on. I apply for it. I get the email back, and they're like, absolutely, you are welcome to join us. Um, and I was super excited. I was like, wow, I can't believe I got into this course. Really excited about that. And about two weeks pass, and then I get an email back, and they say, hi. Um, we thought you were a graduate student, not someone early in high school, and we're not legally allowed to accept you into the course uh, until you're past 18 years old. And that was brutal. Um, and me, having been, I think, like a fifth term president of my school or whatever, I was very involved in student government. Um, I thought, well, I've had success challenging these kinds of decisions. So what I did is I wrote a letter to the board of the American Museum of Natural History and said, hey, I want to be a part of this course, um, but you know your rules make it so I can't do that. I was accepted. I, I feel like I should be able to go. And they reconsidered and changed the policy for the American Museum of Natural History for their field courses to allow people under 18 to go if they're accompanied with a guardian or a family member who's over 18. So my grandmother, who is a very accomplished scientist, a weed scientist, actually not marijuana, but weeds like in a, a garden, um, she came along with me down to Arizona. And that answer the Southwest course was a really big um, pivotal moment where I saw that I actually could have a, a career as a myrmecologist um, and actually use a lot of the skills and knowledge that I got from ant keeping to further that career. So I got back from Ants of the Southwest and I started working on my new idea, which was the ant network. And the ant network is very different today than what it was in my mind then. In my mind then, I wanted to get a bunch of ant keepers together and teach them how to give presentations to schools around the United States. Because I, at that point, had given about 20 different presentations to schools about ants, showed them live ant colonies, and I wanted to do that all around the country. But that was a little too ambitious at the wrong time. It's something we want to do in the future, but that wasn't quite the right thing to do at the time. So we ended up switching over to focusing on videos, online content, really helping build an ant keeping community. Um, and that's what we're still doing today. And... There's not much that I can talk about with what we've got going on now because a lot of it's on hold, but I can tell you that this is going to be a really big year for the Ant Network. You're going to see a lot of content, uh, a lot of new resources coming from the organization uh, over the next probably eight months or so. Um, 
And before we switch over to questions, I do want to tell you a little more about how the Ant Network works. It's not just me. There's a big team. We've got six advisors. Uh, that includes Ray Mendez, who is probably the most experienced ant keeper on Earth. Um, that awesome. includes uh, somebody like Peter Nalen, who is a great business professional, startup professional, whole bunch of different people. Bob Peterson is one of our main advisors. He's, he is the former president of the Entomological Society of America. Um, we're working hard to make this a really big deal. The team itself also includes me, uh, Ben, who is our filmographer and media producer, Thomas, who is our business manager, and Jen, who is our graphic designer, and she's also a hymenopterist, so somebody who studies hymenoptera, which are ants, bees, wasps, and sawflies. Um, so that is the core Ant Network team. Uh, I know it often seems like it's just Miles, <laughs> uh, and I am definitely the face of the organization, but it's actually a lot bigger than that. Um, at this point, I would like to move over to those questions. I think those will... Um, help talk more about the journey. I guess I need to tell you what I do right now. And right now I'm finishing up my degree at Montana State University, where I study entomology, environmental science, political science, and science communication. Uh, I also work for the National Park Service, and I identify ants for them in the national parks. Right now I'm focused on characterizing the ant species of Yellowstone National Park. So that's a multi-year National Science Foundation project. Um, and I'm hoping to start publishing results from that uh, later this spring. Um, I am graduating in the next month, which is very exciting. And I will then be pursuing a graduate degree somewhere. That's not all sorted out yet. And there's been a lot of delays associated with this uh, situation in academia. But that is basically what's going to happen. I will be spending most of this summer down in Arizona uh, making content for you guys. Um, and I'm going to need your help promoting that and continuing to grow the community. We have a huge opportunity to grow ant keeping as a community this year. Um, and I hope you guys will join us in that effort. So let's switch over to questions. All right. And we're actually up to uh, 40 people now. <clears throat> awesome. Yep. Okay, so questions. Um, and again, we'll have a more general, um, like open-ended kind of session. Um, and um, if you guys have like tangential questions and want to be unmuted for this, um, just say it in AMA voice text. Um, Noebel is watching the channel. Um, and he, he'll also jump in if you can't speak. Um, he'll just jump in with the question as well. So, okay. Um, Dingo asks... Right. Before before you ask the first question, I do want to say, sure. you know, especially in an AMA like this, we're talking about my opinions and my experiences. Right. Um, there are people with different opinions than what I have, but I'm going to give you my best understanding of what entomology is like um, from my experiences working for the president of the Entomological Society of America. So I feel like I've got a pretty good good sense uh, of the topic. Yeah. Okay, so um, Dingo asks, what exactly do you have to do to take a course in myrmecology? That's a great question. Um, I hate to break it to you. There basically are no courses only <laughs> focused on myrmecology. There is the ant course and there's the ants of the Southwest course. Um, but that being said, there are a lot of courses related to entomology that uh, are very applicable to myrmecology. Okay. Uh, Gooseman asks, uh, what does day-to-day -day work in myrmecology entail? That's a great question. And the answer is going to vary a lot depending on the kind of research that you're working on. So right now for me, I'm actually doing a lot of identifications and processing of samples. So Yellowstone National Park and their volunteers have sorted out pitfall trap samples into vials of just ants. And then the ants get delivered to me. And I pull them out and identify them using the latest um, keys and, and taxonomic materials. Uh, and by the latest, sometimes that means 1940-something. Okay, there, <laughs> there's a lot of variation in uh, the kind of quality of uh, information out there. I also rely heavily on other myrmecologists, and especially taxonomy-focused myrmecologists, when it comes to identifying ants that are very difficult to identify, 
or have species complexes um, with very difficult ants to identify. Formica is probably the myrmecologist's greatest nightmare. And lucky for me, they are the most common genus in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, if you are doing some of the lab stuff that I do in terms of keeping ants, your day-to-day -day is going to involve a lot of cutting up apples, um, <laughs> a lot of uh, cutting up mealworms, putting fruit flies into ant colonies. Uh, I know NURBS can talk about this all day long. Um, one of the things I think ant keepers don't necessarily realize is the sheer amount of work that goes into maintaining lots of ant colonies, especially large ant colonies. And that can take some of the joy of ant keeping away. Um, for many, many years, I was the kind of ant keeper. Um, I was never into Pokemon, but I've, I've heard that this analogy works really well, where you want to collect them all, collect every species, have ant colonies, of everything. <laughs> And that actually turns out to be a very difficult thing to do. And I think it's one of the reasons a lot of people quit ant keeping itself is because they get overwhelmed and disinterested. Um, so that's something that you have to be kind of aware of if you're going to go in and study ants is that ants are going to become or they could become your career. That doesn't mean they should also become all of your personal life. And that's a mistake that I made at one point where I would go to work, work with ants for eight hours a day. And then go home and everyone's like, we want more ant network videos. It's like, you know, I've been thinking about ants for a long time today. It's kind of hard to do that. So it's important to not allow yourself to get too burned out if you're pursuing something like entomology, um, because you can kind of lose sight of the things that interest you and the things that got you into it. That being said, there are days that are just not fun. Um, but for the most part, entomology is an incredibly rewarding field to go into. And it's only going to become more and more important as we deal with more issues like climate change, infect infectious disease, biodiversity loss, um, the modernization of learning. Uh, one of the things we focus on with the ant network is actually getting students kind of hands-on opportunities with ants. And if not that, still be able to experience the natural world. Um, and entomology is an incredibly unique it's a uniquely accessible field for people to learn about and engage with even if they can't go out into madagascar um or the amazon rainforest we can bring ants to them and that's really valuable okay um uh Turgenid asks do you ever work with engineers do you think entomology work could be boosted by machine learning and uh, other such new technologies. Absolutely. Uh, give me just a second. I'll paste a link of a project that I did with an engineering professor at Montana State University, which received uh, a lot of recognition from the National Science Foundation, uh, which is very exciting for, cool. for us. Um, so you don't need to read that right now. But take a look here. Entomologists. Uh, often work in interdisciplinary fields. So we work with other scientists, other... Really, really quick, um, yeah. for, the, for the YouTube recording, um, the link that he posted was uh, um, MSU Engineering Professor wins prestigious uh, National Science Foundation Award. Um, if you stick that into Google, it'll come up as a montana.edu link. Yes, thank you. Sure. Um, so... Basically, what I did in this particular instance is we worked with our engineering department to figure out what kinds of flying insects could be modeled to help us make smaller drones. So it turns out there are physical characteristics of large drones like quadcopters that can only be made so small to the point that they no longer work. So the rotary mechanism can only be made so small before it no longer functions properly. So we wanted to figure out, is there a way to make a smaller drone than we can with rotary technology? And what we've done over the past couple of years is model the tobacco hornworm moth, or Manduca sexta, uh, and I've been raising those and helping uh, them look at the wing shape, look at muscle shapes, and create even smaller drones. And those kinds of technologies are dependent on entomologists, but we also work with the engineers who can make that happen. So that's just one example of interdisciplinary work. Um, ants are incredibly important 
when it comes to understanding how we can model natural systems for our own use. So a lot of train networks, package delivery systems work on models that are based on algorithms um, that were created from observing how ants forage because they have an incredible optimal foraging system where they cover a certain amount of ground uh, to result in um, basically getting food or finding what they need. So it's a very complicated thing, but the point is ants and other insects are incredibly important for lots of different fields. And because of that, entomologists work with people in basically every field. Uh, and that's one of the most exciting aspects of entomology, if you ask me. <laughs> okay. Uh, Cheese McWaffles asks, have you ever worked with myrmecologists from international regions? Yes, absolutely. So the trip that I did with Brian Fisher and Bonnie Blamer over to Madagascar this past summer involved mostly American entomologists and myrmecologists. But we also worked with the native uh, Malagasy entomology department at the university in Antananarivo. Um, there's a lot of international collaboration that occurs between entomologists, especially those that work in tropical settings. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm kind of like jumping around the channels and, and DMs and all that as I usually do during these. Um, okay. Uh, Panera, Panarin Cat asks, uh, how much time is spent out in the field and any general advice uh, to, career, uh, to pursue a career in life sciences? Oh, that's a very good question. So two-part question. I'm going to talk about the first part right now. How much time is spent in the field is dependent on a whole bunch of factors. Um, one for me in Montana is what is the season, right? So winter in Montana lasts for between seven and about seven, eight months or so. So it's a really long, really cold winter. Um, and that makes our ecosystems really fascinating when spring rolls around. You see an absolute transformation with the insect life. But the winter is extreme. So the work that I do is in the lab, it's making videos, it's um, doing these kinds of AMAs during winter. Um, that's very different than, say, July, where July would uh, have me in Yellowstone National Park collecting specimens or helping with bee research in uh, northern Montana. What you do on a day-to-day -day basis varies significantly if you are in a seasonal area or you're working and doing in a seasonal area. I will say that oftentimes our weeks were split about 50-50 between doing field work and doing lab work. Um, and lab work, there's a lot of variation. That could be taking care of ant colonies. It could be identifying specimens. could be cleaning the lab. That's actually a really important thing to do. It takes a lot of time. Um, so there's a lot of variation in what you do. And that's part of what I love about entomology is that there, you almost never do the same exact thing um, every single day. Uh, that being said, I don't want you to think that it is absolutely exciting and thrilling every single day. It's a lot of work. It's difficult, especially during the summer when you might be working 10, 12 hour days because you're trying to get research done that can only be done in a couple of months. Um, but there is a lot of variation and the kind of entomologist that you become will have a big effect on the kind of work that you do in a lab or in the field. And the second, right, what, can you remind me of the second part? Sure, sure, sure. Um, the second part to that question was any general advice to pursue a career in life sciences? Okay. Uh, yeah, I've got, I've got a couple of pieces that I think would be important for anyone who's interested in doing that. Number one, I think it's really important that you have an understanding of why you want to go into the life sciences. Um, and if you do, fantastic. If you don't, I really encourage you to think that through. Um, a career in the life sciences is difficult. Um, it is academically challenging, and I also think it's one of the most rewarding ways to spend your life. Um, but if you really don't have a concerted, a, a real focused interest in life sciences, don't go into them. All right. So if you did decide that, yes, you want to be in the life sciences, there are a couple things you can prepare for. So if you're in high school, 
it's really good to take advantage of any kind of dual credit opportunities involved in life sciences, any sort of um, AP courses that can kind of get you ahead. Um, it's also important to focus on your mathematics skills. I will say that math remains the number one most difficult thing I deal with in my life, and it's not something I'm good at. That's okay. E.O. Wilson will tell you that's okay. You have to have the attitude that you will get through it, and you have to be able to put in the time to study for, to sort of make up for any issues you have with mathematic skills. You don't have to be great at it, but you do have to try. And if you try, you're going to be able to get through it. Um, that often leads to challenges in something like chemistry. Okay, um, Chemistry and mathematics are the two areas in the life sciences where we lose the most students. People give up um, very early on. So you see really high dropout rates at universities in life sciences because they hit a math class and they either don't like it or think, oh man, I'm going to have to use math every day. This is not the career for me. It's not true. I think it's unethical, but universities have been using math and chemistry courses to try and reduce the loads of students going into life sciences. Um, that doesn't go for every university, but there is a general trend there. Um, so what you can do is go into your high school and university educations with an open mind about math and chemistry. You don't have to do a fantastic job on them, but you do have to try. And one thing that I really encourage you to do is get a tutor if you struggle with it. So that early on that you earlier on that you can build confidence in those areas, the better you're going to do, I think, in a university setting. Hand in hand with that challenge for a lot of students, and if, if, if that isn't a ch challenge for you, congratulations, it's a challenge for almost every biologist. Most people who study biology, especially ecology, uh, are not very good at math, or it's not something that they enjoy doing, and that's okay. It's, a, it's something that we have uh, in common in the discipline. Um, so it's important to kind of build skills, build confidence, or at the very least have a good attitude about. I will tell you now at the end of my college career that I have absolutely no regrets about spending a couple hours a night with a tutor or, or uh, studying these things to pass those courses because they have unlocked an incredible career and world that really is not nearly that dependent on mathematics. Um, so it's it's a challenge, but it's something that you can get through if you are dedicated to having that kind of a career. All right, um, hand in hand with that is finding things that you find engaging and interesting in high school and in college. It's absolutely critical um, that you have sort of an escape or a way to further your interests. I did a lot of work with ants when I was in high school. And I, if that's the kind of thing that you want to study, great. Um, continue ant keeping, continue learning about ant biology, whatever it is uh, that's going to keep you going and get you through to, you know, pass that, uh, pass high school, pass college, that sort of thing. Um, uh, just really quick. Did, did I fully answer that question? I think so. Panarin, are you with us here? Not seeing him, but I guess you'll see the recording. Um, I thought you did a great job with that question. Uh, really quick, I added a section for general Q&A questions um, down below, just so that we can keep it a little bit separate from the AMA topic questions. Um, I know a lot of people have like general questions they want to ask you that aren't necessarily related to the topic. Um, so everybody, if you could please um, stick them down in there instead of in the AMA questions channel. Okay. Um, the next question, uh, JC asks, what is your favorite and your least favorite part about being a myrmecologist? And I guess you've already answered this in part, but uh, sure. anything else you want to um, say? Yeah, absolutely. A couple of things. Um, one of my favorite parts are the communities associated with ants. If it's the professional community, the myrmecologists that I know, you know, Corey Moreau, uh, I, I won't go, go into it, but there's just a really great group of people 
who research ants, especially uh, the the graduate students and even undergraduate students who are going into myrmecology right now. There's just a really phenomenal research community, very supportive. And some of my best friends have come from those engagements. One of the things I think that frustrates me about myrmecology um, is really just the process of getting there. Um, it's it's just not straightforward if you haven't had a mentor who understands it. And that's part of why I wanted to give this AMA is because I know so much more about how to do it than I did when I started. So there was a lot of frustration with getting involved with it that has now been resolved because now I'm in the community. I understand how the whole thing works. And I, I just, um, I want to add to that. Um, when I went to the entomology conference um, in 2019, um, that was like, I was trying to kind of get a bead for the things that Miles is talking about here today. Um, but <clears throat> what he's saying about finding a mentor, um, that was um, echoed everywhere. Um, whenever I asked this kind of question, um, everybody said, you need a mentor, you need a mentor, you need a mentor. Um, it's so incredibly important to find somebody that can, um, that you can really trust and have them take you under their wing and kind of like guide you through this whole process. Um, so I just, I don't know, I, that was one of my biggest takeaways from the conference, um, is everybody just saying that to me over and over. Um, so I just wanted to kind of hammer that in. You know, and, and I want to reiterate that a little bit. I would say almost every aspect of my life that has been successful, I can trace those successes to fantastic mentors. Um, there's a lot of things I'm not skilled at. One thing I feel like I'm pretty skilled at is identifying people who will invest in me and will allow me to invest in, invest in their work as well. It's a two-way street. Um, Ray Mendez, uh, frankly, first of all, I should say, please don't contact him. Um, <laughs> he, he's not in, a, in the phase now of really being able to mentor a lot of people. He's a fantastic mentor for me at the stage of life that I was in. Um, Dr. Robert Peterson, president of the Entomological Society, also a fantastic mentor. Ann Mayo, the person who referred me to the ant course in the very beginning, also a great mentor. You can find these people. They're in your high schools. They're in your colleges. Uh, and what you can do to build that relationship is really engage with their work. Um, and you can even say, you know, I'm looking for a mentor or I'm looking for someone to help me better understand um, how to build a career in the natural sciences or how to make an impact in X, Y, or Z. Those connections are really what run the world. You know, I've done, aside from ants, a lot of work in public policy, and that involves meetings on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., and working on health care policy and meeting with Mitch McConnell. Those kinds of opportunities come from having connections with people, and you build those connections by really investing in relationships. Um, I wouldn't be able to get a recommendation letter from the United States Senator from Montana, John Tester, if I hadn't built a relationship with, with him and with officials in the state. And you do that by being genuine and being invested in what they're doing and also sharing your aspirations. So there's lots and lots and lots of opportunities to find great mentors. You have to be a great person to that person if you want to have the high quality mentorship that's really going to get you where you want to go. Uh, as an entomologist or otherwise. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Miles. Okay. So, um, sorry, I'm I'm trying to, I'm jumping around a lot. Uh, what would oh, I do want to say real quick? If you don't have a mentor, that's okay. Go find one. Yeah, it's it's incredibly important. Okay, uh, Army of Insects asks, uh, would you recommend us students attend ant course like you did? What are other ways to get involved? Um, so two-part question. You want to tackle the first one first? Yeah, so first of all, I would say that's probably not the best place to focus your energy right now. I definitely don't recommend that anyone who isn't currently looking to pursue a degree in a graduate school degree in entomology I don't recommend that you apply for the ANT course, which is Brian Fisher's course. When the ANTS of the Southwest course comes back, that is the sort of thing that I think that you should look into applying. 
Um, it's a course that I took, and then uh, I think it was two years ago, I was actually a guest instructor. So I taught people how to collect ants and how to keep ants alive in the laboratory setting. Um, if, if and when that course comes back, it's a great thing to apply to. But don't think that, okay, I have to take this course or I can't be an entomologist. Or I can't go into myrmecology. It's not true. Uh, there's lots of things that you can do. Um, I know Army of Insects has been looking at doing some kind of basic uh, studies in, I think it was Colorado. Uh, you can start and getting involved in entomology projects just really uh, quick, as early as high school. Really quick before um, you continue on with the question. Um, he mentioned uh, Ants of the Southwest, and there's quite a bit of interest in that um, in the channel. Um, I wanted to say that uh, uh, Milta, uh, Mr. I Love the Ants, uh, went to... Ants of the Southwest, and he actually has a video um, of kind of like his experiences there. Yes. Um, so I'm going to post that in the channel, but for the YouTube um, thing, uh, the for the YouTube recording, um, what you want to search for is Ants of the Southwest, uh, Keeping Ants with Ray Mendez. Um, and it's on uh, Mr. I Love the Ants uh, YouTube channel. Um, so yes, I'll put the so link in the, in, the in the chat. You can see a version of Miles that's six or seven years younger, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that was absolutely a very important day in my life. It's actually awesome that Milta or Chris has a video on that because I can look back and actually see that first day when I, I built that relationship with Ray. So you can trace back that mentorship. I've gone back every year since to go and work with him. Um, those are the kinds of opportunities that you really want to focus on when you can. Um, but yeah, great video. Definitely check it out. Keep in mind, it's been a long time since that video was made. And uh, also that, yes, it looks like a lot of fun. It's also a lot of hard work. Um, so biologists have a phenomenally exciting job, but that doesn't mean that every single day is really, really exciting. There's a lot of hard work that goes into it. And uh, the second part of that question, Army of Insects asks, what are other ways to get involved? Okay, uh, well, one is to see if, if you live in a town that has a research university, that's a great place to start. Um, I think that every state in the United States has at least one university that is tasked with doing agricultural or biological life science research. So every state in the United States has entomologists working there. Doesn't mean they have myrmecologists. We're a little bit more specialized than that. But every state has entomologists. And many entomologists are very open to mentoring people, getting into the hobby. It's a, it's a very, in, in the hobby or the, uh, as a career. Uh, it's a very accessible area of the life sciences versus something more like uh, CRISPR genetics, which is a very niche topic that requires a lot of training. So luckily, entomology is a fairly accessible thing. Um, if you are, yeah, I was kicked out of the Boy Scouts because I wasn't uh, religious. But if you're in the Boy Scouts, there's a lot of opportunities to do projects with insects. Um, I'm not sure about the Girl Scouts in that area. Cool. Let's see, there's all, just tons of different ways you can get involved as a high schooler. And then once you get to college, your opportunities expand dramatically. So there's a lot of things called research um, REUs, Research Experiences for Undergraduates. And these REUs are entomology focused and they're made by institutions like California Academy of Sciences, uh, the Chicago Field Museum, American Museum of Natural History, that kind of thing. You can apply for those as college students and get research there. So I interned at the National Museum of Natural History in the entomology department. So that's the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. as one of my REUs. Another REU would count as like the Madagascar course, um, which I'm not sure what the future of that course is right now, but that's something to apply for once you are in college. Okay. Um, Will asks, uh, this may be per too personal, so skip my question if you want to, but if looking at jobs, they have to be sustainable. So how much money would the average myrmecologist make in your, in your experience? Um, and there's a lot of support for people interested in that. Yes. It's uh, one of the questions we get asked the most. It's also one of the ones that, honestly, the hardest to answer. Um, not because I don't want to answer it, but because that information isn't super easy to get. Because in our culture, we don't really talk about 
uh, pay levels very much. What I can tell you is that the amount of money you make as a myrmecologist is completely tied to the institution that you work at and the level of work that you're doing. So if you're like a lab technician, you can expect to make between ten and fifteen dollars an hour. Um, that's like as an undergraduate. If you want to go into graduate school during your graduate uh, schooling itself, you will generally have an assistantship, uh, either as a teaching assistant or as a research assistant or both, and you will get paid to do your research and your teaching as part of your education. After that, you're going to be looking for an appointment at a university or a government agency, uh, private companies like Bayer, um, lots of different organizations basically hire entomologists and then pay changes significantly as your schooling goes up basically so if you have a master's of science in entomology the amount of pay that you can expect increases significantly than if you just had an undergraduate degree in say biology or zoology if you get a phd in entomology again your pay goes up but if you get a phd in entomology you will actually overqualify for certain jobs with something like a state agency so you have to have sort of a couple different career options in mind when you make those decisions because they will qualify you th for things, but they'll also disqualify you for different careers. The great news is you don't have to have that figured out now. That's something you really learn about and understand late into an undergraduate college experience. It's not something to stress about right now. Um, what I can say is that there are a lot of myrmecologists who can absolutely have a family and have a very comfortable lifestyle. Um, if you're expecting upper three figures in payment, it's not going to happen um, because you just don't see those levels of compensation among academic researchers. Um, but that being said, you can live a very comfortable lifestyle uh, yeah. as a rheumatologist. Um, I think uh, if, if you... Did, 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 I say, did I say three figures? Yeah, he said upper three figures. I misspoke. Figures. I misspoke. I meant upper six figures. Um, so you're not going to be making $800,000 <laughs> a year is what I'm trying to, to yeah. convey. <laughs> <laughs> like, damn, like making, like, can't even expect like 900 <laughs> bucks this year. Like, oh, yeah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh. um, but uh, like if you if you work with, um, just to add on to that, if you work with the Department of, of Agriculture or other um, uh like uh, uh, government institutions, um, the pay is disclosed um, uh, through the Information uh, Freedom of Information Act. Um, so you can look at the general schedule level and you can see what kind of compensation is tied to that. Yes, and public universities are the same way. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Army of Insects asks, uh, what is the best resource for myrmecology? Uh, AntWiki? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it really depends on what kind of myrmecology you're doing. Um, AntWiki is a great source, of course. Um, myrmecologists themselves are great sources. We are incredibly fortunate to have AntWeb, which is a resource that many myrmecologists absolutely take for granted. It doesn't exist. Excuse me. It doesn't exist in pretty much hardly any other fields. It's not like there's a beetle thing, you know, a uh, beetle web that has all the beetles on it perfectly organized the way AntWeb does. Wait. We are very, very fortunate <laughs> to have those kinds of resources. Um, I'll also say there are great books. There seems to have been a little bit of a lull in terms of publishing of books on ants as of late, um, but I could definitely recommend books from Wilson and Haldobler, uh, a couple other authors, that really get you started with kind of myrmecology and how it works. Just keep in mind that the older the resource, the more likely parts of it will be outdated um, as we learn more and more things. You can also use tools like Google Scholar. So you literally type in scholar.google.com and that will help you search for academic articles. So if you wanna learn more about, um, let's see, Campanotus vicinus, for example, and you're like, I don't know much about that species. Um, I want to see what kind of studies have been done on them. You could go to Google Scholar, type in that species name, hit enter, and it's going to generate peer-reviewed research articles on Campanotus vicinus or ones that mention it in some way. Um, so that's a great way to learn a little bit about those, um, you know, a random species or a random topic you don't know about. 
really just just a second um <laughs> I'm hopping around and it's kind of Okay, uh, continuing from the above, um, what resources do you use when caring for a species you've never cared for before? And uh, Cornelius asks that. Sorry, you, you broke up a little bit there. I didn't hear you. No worries. Uh, Cornelius asks, uh, continuing from the above, what resources do you use when caring for a species you've never cared for before? Ah, so the number one resource is experience, but I know that's a really difficult uh, thing to tell somebody who maybe doesn't have experience. <laughs> um, but what you basically want to do if you're caring for a species that you know you don't know a lot of people have cared for, or you've never cared for yourself, um, it's good to research that genus for the first part. Um, it's important to note that genera like Campanotus, for example, are massive. So they include lots of different species with lots of different life histories. So you want to narrow down to maybe the subgenus level. So Tanae Myrmex, for example, will tell you a lot more about the life history of the species that you're, you're dealing with. Um, I also think it's important to note how the colony founds. So are they uh, founded with multiple queens? That's pleometrosis. Are they founded with a single queen? Are they semi-claustral, which means they have to feed during the founding process? Or are they fully claustral, which means they don't? Those are going to have really big effects on how you keep that species going forward. Um, it's also really important to note that you will probably fail. <laughs> uh, it's really difficult to keep ants uh, generally. I think we aren't necessarily honest about the difficulty associated with ant keeping for a lot of people. It is not an exact, exact science. And a lot of the knowledge in ant keeping is you know in people like me nerds has a lot of experience that doesn't mean there's like a place that you can go and learn and then you suddenly know everything about ant keeping it a lot of it is about keeping ants for a long time um gaining experience that way and then you st start to kind of instinctively be able to deal with situations or species you don't necessarily know about uh i'll close this question out by saying there are a lot of people who will be able to give you a good general sense of care instructions for any species that you find, especially in North America. Um, we have a pretty good sense of how to keep North American ant species. And uh, if you want to ask me, want to ask somebody else, we're going to be able to help you kind of experiment and figure out how to keep that species. All right. Uh, Armjohn with a very good question um, with a lot of support here. Um, are there any documentaries, interviews, or papers that could provide insight into being an entomologist or the process of becoming one? That's a good question. Frankly, that's a question I might have to think about a little bit. Um, there are some great ones on E.O. Wilson. There's Lord of the Ants, um, and then there's also Of Ants and Men. I think both were done by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, which were fantastic documentaries. They don't necessarily tell you how to build a career, but you can learn a lot from those sorts of documentaries about how Ed Wilson built his career. Um, it's not necessarily a topic that a whole ton of people have interest in, uh, and therefore there hasn't necessarily been tons of documentaries made on that. That's something that I want to change. And it's one of the goals of the Ant Network is to help people like you guys learn more about the process of entomology and how to become an entomologist. But I will tell you, it's a very challenging topic for us to cover. And that's part of why you don't see that many resources out there on the topic. Okay. I'm just... um. Sorry, so I'm moving the questions around to, to the to the general Q and A section. Um, is there any career option related to or deals? Uh, no, all right. So this is kind of already answered. Um, but what what Ant guy is asking is: um, Is there any career option related to or deals with ants that could also reasonably support a family? I I got. Reasonably support, and then you. I stopped hearing what you said. Dang it! I'm not. I'm not sure. I think it's because we have so many people in the chat. But anyway, um, so Ant Guy asks: Is there any career option related to or deals with ants 
um, I'm assuming other than myrmecology, um, that could also reasonably support an, support a family. Um, so entomologists are employed all over the place, and that's partly because the study of insects is critical to kind of human life on our planet as we know it. If you look at Africa, there's an incredible famine happening over there because of a massive desert locust uh, migration event. Um, so there's people there working on food security. There's people who work for the United States military as entomologists, helping them understand what issues our men and women in uniform might face uh, going into different places around the world associated with insects. So that's like insect-borne diseases or chiggers, which can significantly disrupt uh, a military unit if they uh, set up camp in the wrong place. So entomologists are posted all over the place in lots of different fields, and pretty much in every field that has an entomologist, those entomologists are making enough money to comfortably support a family. It is a skilled profession that is valued by those organizations. Okay. Um, I should also note that entomology, uh, myrmecology less so, but entomology as a discipline is critically important for agriculture. So there's a lot of uh, entomological work that's done related to agriculture, and agriculture is how we produce our food. So they're very secure positions. So you're never going to lose a job. I shouldn't say never, but you're unlikely to lose a job in agriculture because it's one of those critical aspects of human society that we have to invest in. So even if, um, you know, a lot of online companies or news organizations start laying people off, folks who work for state agencies doing agricultural entomology, you can't get rid of those people because they are the key to producing food. So there's a lot of job security associated with being an entomologist. Okay. Oh. Um, next question is, uh, and, uh, we're one hour into this. Um, how you doing, Miles? You okay? I'm good. Um, I've probably got another 40 minutes hour in me. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's, uh, damn, there's actually a lot more questions than the, we're, we're only about a little, little under halfway through. So, <laughs> um, all right. So Dukes asks, uh, how do you as a myrmecologist deal with your data? Do you, do you use spreadsheets or database? What tools do you use to perform data analysis? What are some data elements that we as hobbyists should be sure to keep for future analysis? All right. That's so a that's, a, that, yeah, that's a lot of questions. So let's, let's, <laughs> let's break it down here. Um, how do you deal with your data? Do you use spreadsheets or databases? So I use a specialized spreadsheet that uh, for my work with the National Park Service, that is formatted in such a way that when I send it back to the Park Service, they can input it very easily into their database. So it's sort of a, uh, a question where it's and both. Um, <laughs> most of the work I do would be in Excel. And frankly, I am not a skilled Excel user. <laughs> and that's, I think, good news for a lot of people. You don't have to know a whole ton about data management, but you do have to be able to keep your data very well organized and make sure that it's accurate. Um, so attention to detail is critical. The next, uh, next part. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, what tools do you use to perform data analysis? So I am not somebody who does a lot of data analysis. Um, I will later on in my career, but at this exact stage, there's not a lot that goes on. I will say that R is probably the most common statistical tool being used by biologists and entomologists right now. And um, the last part of the question, what are some data elements that we as hobbyists should be sure to keep for future analysis? That's a good question. Um, it's something that I would love to tackle kind of really in depth with the Ant Network. Maybe not this year, but next year is actually work on some citizen science projects with you guys. But what I can tell you right now is that some of the most valuable data that we could get at, for, as entomologists is associated with nuptial flights. So if you observe a nuptial flight, uh, figure out the date, figure out if you can the species, if not the species, the genus, take pictures, 
And then what you should do is really characterize the location. So where is it? Is it in a forest? Is it in a prairie? What's the soil like? Is it clayey? Is it uh, uh, sandy? I know there's a lot to unpack here. Uh, and then also the nearest weather station to you, you want to get the humidity. That's relative humidity. You want to get barometric pressure if you can, and you want to figure out, okay, what sort of weather patterns, what weather events have happened in the last 48 hours. All of that data uh, associated with nuptial flights is seriously lacking for most ant species. And one of the great aspects of, of collecting that data is that it's really, really useful for ant keepers as well. So you can further our scientific understanding of species by doing that. Plus, you can help other ant keepers better be able to predict when an ant species might fly and when those queens might be able to be collected. And um, just as a, this isn't like, uh, we, we actually have a, a thing going on with um, uh, antflights.com. Um, and they kind of streamline all the information that's relevant. Um, and that information is being compiled into a database with um, uh, AIM, which is the Myrmecological um, Organization in France. Um, so that information is actively being used. And so, um, and all, all the things that Miles listed down about information about nuptial flights, um, it's part of the form when you submit a flight to antflights.com. Um, so if you guys want to contribute to science, that's a really good way to do it. Um, Fantastic. Okay. Uh, Armjoan asks, uh, what went into the organization of the Madagascar trip, i.e., what did you have to plan, uh, prepare beforehand, as well as selecting the people who go? Um, that's a good question. I don't know that I was privy to all of that, but I can talk about what we need to do. Um, the expedition to Madagascar was a pretty big undertaking, and it was made a lot bigger by the fact that I brought along our main cameraman and a massive amount of camera gear, <laughs> which adds to the logistics <laughs> of things because you want to make sure it's all weatherproof because we were going to be filming in a rainforest. Uh, you want to make sure that it's all secure so it can't get stolen, can't get damaged, that sort of thing. Um, so there's a lot of work that goes into getting your gear ready. Aside from the camera equipment, there's a lot of you know equipment associated with um, the research itself. So that means I'm bringing a whole bunch of featherweight forceps, aspirators, vials. Um, they brought a lot of ethanol and vials and other equipment used. Uh, I, you know, don't don't want to sound full of myself. I think we did a really really good job showing what myrmecology is like, the kind of research we were doing in that one documentary that we did there. Um, so if you haven't seen that, please go check that out uh, because you'll see how we sampled for ants in the trees. Um, we used a ton of climbing gear, which was a huge logistical challenge to get into the middle of pretty much nowhere in Madagascar. A uh, huge logistical challenge to get it on airplanes, that kind of thing. Um, so it takes a lot of work to get these things prepared. And then, of course, you have to coordinate with all the students and all the instructors to make sure they have all the gear that they could possibly need, um, including medical supplies, uh, evacuation insurance. I could go on for probably half an hour about all the preparations that are necessary to do field work in a place as remote as Madagascar is. Um, I need to get a glass of water. So <laughs> please excuse me for like you sure. know, 30 seconds okay. a minute. Yeah, no, right I, I got you. Um, also, uh, guys, uh, feel free to ding me in the um, AMA voice text channel. Um, people that are going to be listening to this after the fact or... Um, <laughs> Uh, or just aren't like watching the AMA voice text channel. Um, uh, I, I want to include like the, the bits that people are adding in here. Um, like, uh, what NURBS is saying is, um, one of the big things that you can do is you can s start putting together, um, a, a map or an Excel sheet of, um, uh, the flights that you have local to you and, um, start recording that information and, um, I guess you could even go so far as to reach out to local researchers that w might be interested in that information. Um, and, I'm uh, back. hey, uh, not every path, um, to entomology is the same. Um, 
uh, like uh, NURBS is actually working with Caltech. Um, and uh, I mean, like, uh, li li like, uh, like what we were talking about earlier, uh, Ray Mendez uh, isn't, um, uh, he, he's not an entomologist, right? He does uh, special effects, if I remember right. Yeah, so Ray is probably the most experienced ant keeper that I know, and that's yeah. because he started he started the concept of insect zoos and insect exhibits in museums and zoos and places all around the world. So his job has been actually making those exhibits and learning about how to keep uh, live insects alive. Um, and I very much mirrored a lot of that work in, in my own career as well. Uh, sorry if that gets onto the recording. I just had a phone call. Um, okay, uh, Arm Joan also asks, uh, recently ant, masks, ant, ant maps uh, removed around 400 species listed for Queensland. How would a myrmecologist go about confirming whether or not a species is in a state or a country, as well as correcting any m misinformation on a species? Yeah, that's a good question and not one that I honestly can answer in great detail right now. It's a very complicated topic, and that is an area of controversy where <laughs> myrmecologists may agree or disagree with a decision to maybe change a species name due to new genetic research or X, Y, or Z. There's a lot of reasons those kinds of uh, records might change, and they're very kind of personalized to certain mm events well okay. um i think what he's more what he's asking is um they removed all these species um from the listing um but he's wondering how would um how would how would uh a myrmecologist or even an amateur um like like an ant keep an amateur uh, entomologist go about correcting that information or reporting a species in an area uh, so First thing that you should do if you're an amateur entomologist, and in my opinion, even as an accomplished myrmecologist, is you get a second opinion. Um, so if you're pretty darn sure you've got a species that's never been listed for your state or your county or wherever you are, um, take a look at any kind of keys that are available. Key it out if you can find what species it keys out to. Um, but really, I would send specimens in a little vial of ethanol or propyl alcohol to a myrmecologist or at least a hymenopterist so that somebody who studies ants, bees, wasps, or sawflies, um, because they'll be able to help figure out uh, a close identification. If you think so that something is in a state and it's not listed on those resources, you can actually submit those specimens to an insect collection, and an insect collection would be at a university, pretty much only where you'll find an insect collection aside from like the Smithsonian or the Field Museum. And they can assist you in getting that species or those specimens listed in those areas. Um, it's one of those things that hasn't quite met that modernization that we've seen in a lot of areas of biology. Um, we're lucky to have AntWeb, which allows us to update people on what species are aware pretty easily. I don't know very much about AntMap as a resource, and I don't know how they make those kinds of decisions and whether or not those 400 species are going to suddenly be back on that map again and it was an error i have no way to verify that sort of thing hmm. um i'll close this out by saying the ants of australia are not very well um and there's a lot of redundancy in species names and species records where you might have two species listed and it actually is one because there were two entomologists there, they both drew up their own conclusions and their own records without checking with each other. Um, in areas of the world that haven't had a lot of research, which frankly is anywhere outside of Central America, North America, certain aspects of South America, Europe, there's a lot of unknowns. Um, and it's sort of surprising, I think, to hobbyists because it feels like we know a lot about ants, and we do, but there's way more that we don't know about ants than, than we do. And one of those areas is the distribution of different species uh, in the world. We just don't have that much information for it. And unfortunately, there's sort of a crisis in entomology right now 
where not very many people are becoming taxonomists or systematists. So people who identify insects and, cat and uh, uh, categorize insects, catalog them for a living. Very few people are going into careers there. And it's actually a huge opportunity if you're wanting a career in entomology. We don't have enough systematists um, to meet the demand, which means there's this big backlog of insect species that haven't been named or entered into records or database places, things like that. So um, if any of you like identify kids that are like super active in identification, uh, yeah, you should be reading into that as this is like your opportunity. <laughs> yes. <sighs> okay. Uh, Aunt Duchess asks, uh, do you get a lot of work and study pressure? Um, is Aunt Duchess online? I'd, uh, some clarification would be helpful there. I'm not entirely sure what what they're looking for in terms of work and study pressure. Um, I guess she's she's not online, but what I'm guessing is she means like in comparison to other fields. Um, is there uh, is is the field uh, competitive and difficult? So this is sort of a double-edged sword for us ant people. There are a lot of people who want to study ants. It's a very very popular aspect of entomology, partially because of a fact that we all here know ants are freaking awesome, right? They're wicked cool. But <laughs> that also attracts a lot of people. Um, so you have to be pretty dedicated to pursuing a career in ants if you want to do it. Um, my guess is if you're sitting here and listening to me talk for two hours, you probably have at least a pretty decent interest in doing <laughs> that or at least learning about the process. So first of all, excellent work. <laughs> um, but ants as a research field, is it is quite competitive, I'll be honest. But the good news is ants have proved themselves to be time and time again really important for us to understand. And a lot of great advances in technology have come from better understanding ants. That means that people are willing to sort of make jobs and make opportunities for entomologists who specialize in ants. That does not mean that you will always, if you become a myrmecologist, be working with ants. You might be working on a project with bumblebees. You might be doing a work uh, with another professor on moths, kind of like what I've been doing with the engineers. So there is variation in what you do, but the areas that you specialize in will dictate how you spend most of your career time. Fantastic. And that segues into the next question um, from Armjohn. He asks, how broad is your knowledge expected to be? Uh, would you be expected to fill in for somebody who specializes in studying mites or isopods with identification, collection, etc.? You are expected to be an entomologist, first and foremost. So you're somebody who is knowledgeable about insecta, right? And that is one of the sticking points when I was fairly early into my kind of career process that I was like, you know, I don't really care about beetles. But it turns out that learning about entomology exposes you to different topics and ideas in insect ecology that really help you better understand ants. So I'm a much better myrmecologist now that I've become an entomologist as well. So you do have to have knowledge of entomology. What's not going to happen is if you're a myrmecologist, they're not going to come in and say, you are now our mite specialist, and you have to learn all about mites and how to identify them. That's not going to happen. That's not your area of work. That's like telling someone who studies lions that they're suddenly going to be studying reproduction in humpback whales. Uh, that's not, it, it's not uh, something that occurs in your career. You will be asked to work with animals or, I mean, insects rather, that are outside of your specialty, but you will be given resources or opportunities to learn about those uh, as necessary. So you shouldn't fear that maybe you don't know a ton about feather wing beetles. Uh, if you end up on a project related to them, you're going to have all the resources you need to understand um, feather wing beetles and how to collect them and X, Y, or Z. Okay. Um, Armjohn also asks, and um, I'm not sure if you can have an answer for this. As far as I know, there are not many universities in Australia that offer entomology. What would be some alternatives? So I guess instead of not, not alternatives to university, um, an alternative field that deals with ants, I'm guessing. Armjohn, you might want to clarify this in the uh, AMA voice text channel. 
Um, so if he clarifies, great. But I can talk a little bit about just this the impression that people get about entomology not being widespread. In college, most universities don't offer an entomology major. Okay, there just usually aren't enough courses available to make up a major. I think Iowa State University has one. Maybe UC Riverside, something like that. Um, but for the most part, universities around the world don't offer a undergraduate major in entomology. Many of them, especially ones that have great entomologists on staff, offer minors in entomology or they'll offer an introduction to entomology course. Um, I've been to Australia, but I've never been involved in entomology in Australia, so I don't know what those courses are like. But there are some fantastic entomologists that come from Australia, and uh, I know that they have programs there. It's obviously a fantastic place to be an entomologist. Um, I will also say that oftentimes, if you are interested in pursuing a career uh, in a certain field, um, there are study abroad opportunities that will fit that. So it might be that you're going to a university in Wyoming, uh, but you're interested in ant research and nobody in Wyoming is doing I don't know that to be true, I'm just using that as an example, then you might be able to study at another university for a semester or two where there is active ant research. So there's more flexibility in those kinds of programs than you might expect. Um, but don't necessarily always look for an entomology department and don't necessarily look for an entomology major. In fact, even if you want to be an entomologist, I and, and a lot of entomologists I know would actually discourage you from going into an entomology major as an undergraduate. I think it's more useful to get a background in ecology or uh, zoology, wildlife management, some area like that, before going into a graduate school position in entomology. Um, as a reminder, I study environmental science, political science, science communication, and entomology at Montana State University. And those kinds of fields give you more skills that you can use as an entomologist if you go and pursue any kind of graduate uh, school opportunities. Okay. Um, so Armjohn also asks, and he says he, it was kind of answered at the start, but I kind of want to hear what you have to say on it. Um, the Australian Entomology Society aims to promote the education of entomology within Australia and releases a quarterly journal. Um, is there an American or international equivalent? So I, I guess what he's asking is, are there what entomological journals would you recommend that uh, the community and people that are interested in getting into entomology uh, start reading and pay attention to? Mm -hmm. Excellent question. So I would look into those, uh, if you're in the United States, Honestly, if you're an entomologist anywhere, the Entomological Society of America is going to be the largest and the most well-organized entomological society and organization in the world. And their journals are fantastic. And ESA has done a lot of work to try and make their platform accessible to everyone um, and their journals accessible to everyone. So that's where I would start. If you really want to learn about how to be what's happening in entomology, the Entomological Society of America is where I would kind of begin. Um, it's awesome Australia has that kind of resource. I will say that in countries that have fewer entomologists, there may be a single organization that's really good about focusing on entomology right in that country. Um, it's interesting. I wasn't really aware of what, all of what was going on with antflights.com, but I see the AIM. Uh, organization. That's an ex example of an organization that's very focused on a single country or a single region. Um, and those can be valuable to you if you're in that region or interested in research in that region. Um, but if there's a, one organization, the ESA would be where I would go to learn about that. Cool. Um, so this is pretty specialized, but I guess we can ask it. Um, uh, JPGSP asks, what would be the best way for somebody in the UK to become a myrmecologist? So I'm not necessarily sure. Um, your education system is incredibly confusing to me, but I know that it makes sense to you guys, which is great. Um, 
what I what I will say is that any kind of focus in natural history and biology, ecology is useful. And I know that there are lots of graduate school opportunities that involve ant research in the European Union. Um, I don't know how Brexit is going to affect your ability to engage those resources. I know that there's great research that is done in the United Kingdom. Um, Germany is also another hotbed for ant research. And they are always looking, it seems like, always looking for graduate students in entomology. So if you're willing to go there, which could be a fantastic experience, um, that is an opportunity for you as well. Yeah, I just want to add, um, and this is kind of like around ant keeping as a hobby even, uh, the German ant keeping hobby is massive. Like it's bigger than ours. Um, so I don't know, take a look around. Um, there's lots of stuff. Okay, Ogre asks, uh, would you recommend uh, to look into other fields of entomology other than myrmecology, and would you consider it overhyped? Overhyped. That's <laughs> interesting. Um, I don't necessarily think that entomology is overhyped. I think that people don't necessarily understand what the day-to-day -day life of a myrmecologist looks like, and they think that it's just being out in the field or it's just taking care of laboratory colonies. And there is a lot of administration that happens. There's a lot of bureaucracy you deal with. So I think that maybe it's a little overhyped in terms of, you know, even Steve Irwin, who is a great inspiration to me, spent days in the office doing paperwork. But you don't necessarily see that. So it's important to talk to those people who do that kind of work that you admire so that you get a better sense of what their day to day like, life is like. Um, so that part, I think, might be overhyped. Um, so can you, uh, reiterate or remind me the first part of the question? Um, yeah. Um, so Ogre was asking, uh, would you recommend to look into other fields of entomology other than myrmecology? Um, right. which I guess you've kind of already answered in part. You know, I, I do think I've gone into that some, but I will say that, yes, there is fascinating work in entomology that has nothing to do with ants. Yeah. Um, I've done a lot of work with tiger beetles that are associated with thermal hot springs in Yellowstone National Park. Like, there are so many different aspects of entomology that you don't even consider if you're just looking at ants that I think are absolutely worth considering if you're looking to a career. Um, the great news is that the general track to becoming an entomologist is, it may not be super straightforward, but it's pretty much the same for different fields. You start specializing uh, either as a college student or as um a graduate student so you have a lot of time to sort of kind of figure those things out yeah the other thing is um something that kind of i guess put a little bit of a damper on my interest um and was like a little bit of a surprise to me um was a uh, a lot of the research that you're going to be doing is based on necessity not just what's cool um so like uh there's like a lot of research on like white flies and stuff um, and I don't care about white flies. I think they're kind of gross, um, but it's, it's, it's the, the, um, the significance of the work, uh, drives what kind of work entomologists are, have available to them. Um, at least in my understanding, uh, Miles, yeah, correct it, me if I'm wrong here. For the most part, I think that's true. Um, you know, my first entomology project was in 2013. I was working for Oregon State University. And I was working on an IPM project, and that's integrated pest management, where we had a new species show up on the West Coast that, that was and continues to target berries. So huge uh, economic consequences for this invasive species, potential loss of millions and billions of dollars in agricultural production uh, from this species. So I would go out there and work with them and try and figure out, okay, how do we trap them? How do we kill them? How do we identify them? Um, that was Drosophila suzukii, so the uh, spotted wing Drosophila. Um, unfortunately, a lot of our efforts have failed to contain them uh, in the Intermountain West and the Pacific Northwest. Um, but it's an example of a pressing issue with huge economic impacts where entomologists are absolutely critical to solving that challenge. We see similar things with fire ants. So a lot of ant researchers at some point in their career, will do work with fire ants yep. or other invasive yep. ants because it is really, really important. Um, and it may be that, you know what, you don't really care about Solanopsis invicta. 
but your expertise as a myrmecologist is needed for our nation. <laughs> uh, it, you know, it sounds romantic, but it's actually really, really important for a lot of people uh, that you're able to do that kind of work. So it's absolutely true that necessity drives some of those kind of careers, and it's very, it varies a lot. Um, I will say kind of the golden age of natural history has passed. And it's probably the most heartbreaking thing about my career choice is that there will never be another E.O. Wilson who gets hundreds of thousands of dollars to go fly around the world and just collect new ant species. That part's over. But there's still incredibly exciting opportunities in entomology. You just have to look a little harder and do it with a little bit more of an open mind. <sighs> okay. Um. I guess we're like two thirds of the way through and that's before the general Q and A and I've been moving a lot of the questions over. Um, this is actually like, there's a lot more interest in this than I thought we were gonna get. I thought it was gonna be more casual. Um, you still good to go for maybe another hour, uh, hour and a half? Yeah, let's, let's, let's keep going <laughs> okay. as right. long as I can. All I right, all right. That, that, that tickle in the back of the throat, but we'll, we'll push through it. So. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, uh, let's see. I'll tell you what, a lot of our videos, even the ones that are like two, three minutes, still take longer than this to film. <laughs> so I'm used to talking and repeating uh, a lot of things. Yeah, no worries. All right, all right, all right. Uh, so uh, Armjohn asks, um, or uh, he keeps saying that they're already answered. Um, uh, he, okay, so what, what he asked, and I guess you've, if you just want to like add to what you've already answered on this, what employment options are there for entomologists outside of working uh, the government? Um, and I'm you, actually going to answer that in the context of the government before I go into outside okay. the government. So okay. there's I, I, there's a lot of options in, within the government. So you have people involved in invasive species research and prevention. So that's U.S. Department of Agriculture and state agricultural agencies. Um, you have other, uh, organizations like U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that also employs entomologists. You have the Department of Defense that employs entomologists. So there's a lot of different areas in the government that employs entomologists. Outside of the government, you have public and private universities, which all sort of function in different ways and in different relationships with the government. It's sort of an interesting amalgamation of government meets academia. And then you also have positions in what we call industry. So that's for people who uh, have jobs at, say, um, Bayer, which actually owns Monsanto. So you might have heard of Monsanto. They do genetic research. They also do pesticides. So there's a lot of opportunities if you want to learn about um, how to create effective pesticides or integrated pest management plans. If you want to help us uh, produce more and better food, there's a lot of opportunities for entomologists to work in industry uh, there. You can also form private companies like I have done with the Ant Network, but that's an exceptionally difficult thing to do. And it depends on communities of people who will assist you in that effort. So I've, I've personally received a lot of attention and support from ant, keep, ant keepers with what I'm doing with the Ant Network. I am not going to advocate uh, that you form your own insect-related company. It's exceptionally difficult, and most of them fail. Uh, but there are opportunities to do that um, as well. So those are kind of the, the main areas outside of either the government or academia that you can get employment. Um, there's also things like the Field Museum and the California Sciences. They don't really fit the mold of any of these areas, uh, but they still um, hire people to do research. They still do a lot of natural history research around the world, um, but they don't fit a lot of the formal molds that I've discussed already. And um, when I went to uh, uh, Bugshot, um, I also actually saw, and this might be interesting to some people, there's um, there's there's a, a handful of job opportunities, and I guess it's more entomology adjacent. So I guess like people like Alex Wild are taxonomists, um, but he also um, has a photography business um, with ants and shooting macro photography. Um, again, that's going to be way, way, way more competitive um, than the entomological field as a whole. But uh, anyway, that's just that's that's also there. 
Um, yeah, that's a that's a great point. Um, okay, uh, next question was, uh, what would you say are the biggest? Um, and you've already answered this a bit, but uh, mi- biggest myths and misconceptions about being an entomologist. All right. Well, I'll stop talking about how you know it's not always the glamorous field work or lab work. Um, <laughs> I think one of the things that some people think is that it's really easy to get into or it's really, really difficult to get into, and neither of those are true. It takes it takes work. It honestly, more than anything else, it takes a dedication to building a career in that area. Your very first job is almost certainly not to be the world's greatest myrmecologist for California. But you can build up a career that allows you to be uh, a really fantastic myrmecologist. So it's just that I encourage people to have a little bit of patience and sort of the foresight to see where your career can go uh, over time. Um, Because I think a lot of people get discouraged that, oh my gosh, there aren't three courses on myrmecology. How am I going to be a myrmecologist? It's not going to work. Well, that's not really how the whole field functions at all. Um, So it's important not to get too discouraged and to really reach out to people who know about these things that can guide you through it. I also think that there's a little bit of a myth that myrmecologists aren't accessible to hobbyists, that you are not allowed to contact us. What I will say in tandem with that is that (laughs) myrmecologists get a lot of emails from people saying, hey, I want to be a myrmecologist, or hi, I found an ant colony. What is this ant? Um, I process probably between five and 20 to 25 ant identification requests every day or two. Um, And most myrmecologists aren't willing to do that. Um, But I, I do think that when I talk to other myrmecologists about there being this great kind of ant keeping community, most of them are not aware of it. And if they are aware of it, they think, oh, it's just a bunch of immature kids. So if you do engage with myrmecologists, and I encourage you to do so very carefully, you need to be professional. (laughs) Check your grammar. Make sure that you are presenting yourself in the absolute best light, because a lot of the mid-career and early-career myrmecologists would love to hear from you as long as you are professional and open-minded. Yeah, and I want to just kind of reiterate that. Um, That that mentality of being professional and not just being like a bunch of immature kids that's a ton of the driving force behind the server um like i said earlier it's why we can do these kind of things um i mean like other communities will scare people off um uh scare scare like scientists off um because it's just they don't want to take part in it um you know yeah so and and i do want to add you know I think over maybe the past month or two, I've seen an increase in sort of immature behavior. on, that. And I think a lot of that is linked to anxiety about the current situation. But I really grimace. I, I wince when I see people posting a lot of memes or jokes about coronavirus or basically anything that does not cast this community in a really professional way because it's going to mean that that myrmecologist role on here is going to remain at one, which which is me. Um, And if we want to kind of grow our interactions with myrmecology, um, that professional behavior is probably the most important aspect of it. Yeah. Um, And I would say the same thing (laughs) goes for uh, really foul language. Um, Academics just don't have a lot of patience for that kind of thing. And I think it's really important that we continue to have open and fun community here but just please keep in mind of that aspect that your actions can have a direct effect on ant keeping as a community as a whole because what we do here and on other forums is so public and honestly accessible to myrmecologists yep there's a lot of well anyway (sighs) okay next question um and um, I'm going to try and, I guess we can try and pick up the pace a little bit. I don't want to keep you for too long. Um, do 
much. Okay, so I feel like this has been touched on, and I keep saying this, but um, are there any other career paths that involve working with invertebrates other than entomology specifically? General ecology, general wildlife biology will have some involvement with insects. Um, certain areas of engineering continue to see involvement with insects, mechanical engineering, especially in the fields of biomimicry um, and bioengineering, oh, uh, bio-inspired engineering. There's lots of different little ways they call themselves, um, but it's all focused on using uh, different animal species, learning from them to influence our own engineering projects. Yeah, in the medical um, field in general as well. But, but if, yeah, in, in medical. But if you want a career that often involves insects, entomology or an entomology adjacent field is the way to go. Um, training as a marine biologist in California is probably not going to put you with a whole bunch of ant colonies in Arizona. Mm. Uh, uh, Random asks, um, in Brazil, a country full of preconceptions about keeping ants or other insects as pets, do you think it's viable to become an entomologist? So many of the great entomologists that I have known over the past four years or so come from Brazil. Um, yep. I don't necessarily understand a lot of the political movements that are occurring there right now. I know that it jeopardized a lot of entomology and other academic areas. So I'm not sure what the entomological opportunities are there right now, but I can say that in general, Brazil is a great place to learn about insects and even ants. And one thing that Brazilian institutions enjoy are really good relationships with Western universities. So many of our great entomology graduate students tend to come from Brazil. Um, so there are opportunities there, but I, I get the sense from them and from other sources that sort of the nationalistic tendencies that are occurring even around the world are having pretty disruptive effects on those areas of academia. And hopefully, level-headed people will prevail and we can get a little bit more progress um, in making entomology accessible again for certain people in certain countries. Mm. Um, Joan asks, when studying entomology, is field work and helping professors, etc., uh, basically getting work experience a part of it, or is it mostly theory? Um, I think, and I come from a public university, so my experience is different than someone who's maybe at Harvard studying entomology, but I come from a public university where much of your training is hands-on. So, you know, as many classes as I've taken, really the, the valuable things that I've done have involved field work, being involved in projects, being involved in awesome. pollinator research, things in Yellowstone, lots of different stuff that maybe aren't ants, but are entomology related. That's a big part of your education and qualification as an entomologist. Cool. Um, uh, Halal asks, um, also, how uh, different is the route for forensic entomology and what routes are there? You cut out there for me. I heard uh, how different sorry. is the route for forensic entomology. Yeah, and what uh, routes are there? That's a great question. I think forensic entomology is probably the area of entomology I know least about. Um, that could being you, said, could I you know someone start with who is what forensic? Most... Sorry, I didn't mean to talk over you. Could you start with what forensic entomology is um, for people that sure, don't know? Yeah. So forensic entomology utilizes what we know about insect lifestyles to generally understand crime. There's other aspects of forensic entomology, but the, the biggest one is basically, um, this is some CSI stuff right here, uh, basically be able to characterize when events happen um, because of the insect activity. So if a dead body is found of a human or even of an animal, they can look at what stages uh, a fly larva is, for example, uh, where in its development it's along and determine a likely cause of death, or I mean, not cause of death, time of death. Um, forensic entomology has a lot of different facets and aspects, and it's not all as romantic as being Mr. CSI. You come in and solve the 
serial killer murder case. But <laughs> it uh, is critically important to law enforcement uh, work um, in Western countries. And again, there's a lot of different applications of forensic It's all very complicated, and it's almost entirely reliant on your understanding of the ecology of a region uh, and of the insects that are usually associated with, um, honestly, bodies and other things. It's a very small field. There's not very many people who are employed as forensic entomologists, but the ones who do, frankly, have a very lucrative career, um, but they also have a great responsibility to do the very best science they possibly can. If anyone here is really interested in a career in forensic entomology, the mentor of one of my mentors is a fin is just a phenomenal uh, forensic entomologist. So I can put you in touch with them. Awesome. Um, okay, and uh, so earlier you mentioned uh, that you helped universities. Um, uh, how did uh, you help them? on how to keep ants in early high school. How did that happen and what was it like? That's a great question. So things have changed a little bit uh, for the better, I think, in terms of people understanding how to keep ants alive. But in a general sense, many myrmecologists have a very, very basic understanding of ant husbandry or otherwise ant care, basically. Um, so er in early high school and late high school, I had that knowledge. Um, less of it was available online. And I to provide it to universities and programs who wanted to study ants in laboratory settings, uh, which was very exciting. And I kind of grew a profile. I a call or, or an email, I think it was a call one day actually from NASA, and they wanted to put ants on the space station. They oh, asked no if way. I could help them put ants on the space station. You were involved with that? Seriously? That yeah. made like huge amounts of news. Here, I'll get, yeah. the, I'll get the link for everybody. So... The story is not nearly as cool as it sounds when you start it. Um, so they contact me, and I'm like a second-year high school student. And they contacted me in, I think it was January. Um, and I'm from northern Idaho, which means winter. Okay, And they wanted like 5,000 tetramorium, back then it was case spitum, but now it's immigrants, uh, worker ants. And I was like, oh, man, um, when do you need them by? And they're like, two weeks from now. <laughs> and like, okay, I can't do that unless you want to fly me to Florida or something. Um, and what I was able to do is get them in touch with somebody who was in a warmer area that was able to provide those ants to awesome. NASA. But that's the kind of thing that if you get involved in this kind of community and you conduct yourself really professionally, you can have really incredible opportunities that you can't even predict. And one of those was getting that call from NASA which I actually had to get the second call because the first call I decided was a prank and I hung up on them. And they're like, no, 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 it's really, it's really true. We are NASA and we need your help. Um, <laughs> so th th there's some pretty exciting things that happen with that. That's freaking awesome. Okay, uh, early on, uh, you said that at Ants of the Southwest, it really opened your eyes um, to entomology as a career. Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit? What specifically happened at Ants of the Southwest um, that changed things for you? Yeah, I would love to talk about that. So at Ants of the Southwest, I met a number of great myrmecologists, including but not limited to Michelle Lannon, um, Gordon Snelling, Terry McGlynn, and they are ant people through and through. Their careers are focused on ant research and in ant behavior. And the exposure I had had to entomologists before that experience was that they all worked in agriculture and they were all completely focused on pest insects and not ants. And what I saw when I was at Ants of the Southwest is that there's actually this great community of ant researchers who do important ant research, but that are not necessarily agricultural entomologists. So that showed me that, oh wow, there's actually a career possibility here. It also gave me the inspiration to start the Ant Network. And the other aspect of the Ant Network that I really wanted to do was to unite ant keepers who have lots of knowledge about ants and ant behavior and ant ecology with ant researchers who have less knowledge on those topics. Um, that turned out to be a very lofty goal, a very difficult one to accomplish. 
uh, and one that I'm still working on uh, to this day. If, if it's not obvious, um, I, I think I think it's clear that that's one of the the motivations I have, and it's one of the reasons I'm willing to spend three hours with you guys here today <laughs> because I I really care about um, kind of uniting those areas and working together to better understand ants, not only for the sake of ants, but because ants are some of the most important organisms on Earth. And improving our understanding of that will help us solve some of the great problems that we're going to face this century. Uh, Not to sound a little, not sound too politician-y, which I can go off on tangents there, but I really think that it's important work. And I think that everyone here has the ability to contribute meaningfully to that work. So it's one of the areas that I care a lot about um, working on in the future. Absolutely. Um, you also mentioned um, in the introduction, and these are the, these last three are all my own questions, um, you, you wanted to start working with people um, t- through the AMP network to start doing presentations. Um, we've actually, and I, I might have mentioned this before, we actually have quite a few people that are very interested in starting doing that um, or have even started on their own. Um, if, it, if it's, I mean, albeit it's like um, parents doing presentations for their elementary school classes. Um, but you mentioned that that's one of your like stretch goals with uh, the AMP network. Um, how can people work with you or um, get going on that? Because there is a good amount of interest for that. Um, and I feel like people are really, like, they just don't know where to start. Yeah. It's something I started doing in early high school because my high school teachers were looking at the, the work I was doing with live ants, and they are like, wow, this is really interesting, and you're a natural teacher. Um, we, we think you should, you know, show our community what you do. So I started going to other schools, elementary schools in particular, and kind of showing them my, my aunt. And that developed over time to be a little bit more intentional, a little bit more refined. I kind of know if I'm going to go into a first grade classroom, I generally know what questions the, the kids are going to have and what stories they're going to tell. And then I can use that experience to help them better understand bigger topics. So I actually use ants as a tool to understand bigger and even more important topics than just ants. Um, ants are awesome in their own right, but we also want students and, and people in general to have powerful takeaways from what we do. So that's something I focus on doing is figuring out, okay, how do I use ants to talk about climate change? How do I use ants to talk about the loss of biodiversity around the world? Um, and it works really well. And it's something I really am interested in focusing on. Um, and I would say that, frankly, I'd love to hear from the people who are interested in doing that. I can give them tips. We have hit a lot of roadblocks when it comes to actually developing Ant Network branded curriculum for use in different states. Um, the more formal you make this sort of thing, the more regulations there are involved in it. Um, so there are certain boundaries that we will overcome. It just takes us some time to develop those resources. And that attention is in direct competition with, you know, all the requests I get to make this video or go on this adventure, or I get a call to go down to South Africa and work with pangolins, which was a a phenomenal experience, but it takes time and energy away from these other projects. Mm. Uh, I will say that the people who are truly, genuinely interested in helping with those things, there's lots of work that they can do to improve things and we're at the end i work we're very cautious about this but we're always open-minded to join our cause so yeah. you know after this um yeah. after the ama um and just i'm just gonna say this now uh we can put together a channel um get all the adults that like i i have like a list of people that would be interested in working with you and putting together like um curriculum and they can do their own research on what um, they need for their state or whatever. Um, we can actually just put all that together and like get it going. Um, so let's just let's talk about that after this. Um, okay, next question. Um, is there a big way? Um, is there a big difference in the way an American entomologists operate compared to entomologists in more tropical regions? That's an interesting question. I don't feel like I am necessarily qualified um, to answer that holistically or fully. 
um, I will say that American entomology is very seasonal, right? In, in extreme ways for people like me who live in Montana, at least for another month, uh, where winter is super long, which means that you have a very set field season when you can do field work. Whereas in the tropics, that's not really the case. You do have dry and wet seasons, and that can dictate insect behavior, uh, patterns, lots of different things that could affect your research. But for the most part, they can conduct their research when and where they want to, almost whenever they want to. And American entomologists have to work within two big boundaries. One of them is winter, and the other one is academia itself, so the calendar of academic work. A lot of ant researchers are also professors who might teach something like insect ecology or wildlife biology, and those teaching schedules also dictate when they can do research or at least when they can do certain kinds of field research. Um, so it's not necessarily America versus tropics. It's more of where in the world are you and how developed are your academic research systems? Um, America being probably one of the countries with the most developed and bureaucratic academic research systems in the world. Hmm. Uh, Brad asks, what grades do you need to become an entomologist? Good question. Um, that varies for the different programs you want to go into. If you want to study entomology at Cornell, <laughs> you need to be doing extremely well in your courses and have examples of community service work. If you want to attend a state university like me, uh, your grades should reflect the fact that you care about learning and you care about your professionalism. They don't necessarily need to be a four point. I didn't go into college with a 4.0, which for people who maybe don't use that system is like your highest level of grades possible. I went in with a lot of community service stuff. I was the president of my high school. Um, I did a lot of research and work with that kind of stuff that qualified me for what ended up being a full ride scholarship at Montana State University. So I will say that your grades are not critical in terms of being perfect, but they should show that you are dedicated to uh, pushing yourself academically. I will also say that somebody who has a perfect 4.0 and has never been involved or never been involved in research or been interested in science, you know, really not shown initiative other than getting great grades, those are not the most competitive applicants for entomology or really any uh, areas of research or work. I sit on a lot of com committees at the university. I've been in a whole lot of meetings and the students that we value are the ones who are not only great academically or try academically is probably the better way to put it, but are also valuable members of their communities. And I will say that my entrance into Montana State University had a lot to do with my involvement in online communities. So something like this right here, if you put it on your resume that you've been an active member of an ant keeping community and this is what you've accomplished and you've been working towards, you know, helping research or getting uh, presentations done in schools, that kind of work is incredibly valuable and it's really unique. And that will help you stand out uh, as a candidate for uh, any university program. And I just want to say if any of you are like applying to college or university programs, um, and you want a letter of recommendation from me um, about what you've done on the server um, and ways that you've contributed um, to the community and areas of expertise that you expertise that you've shown. Um, I'm happy to write a letter of recommendation um, and, if you're trying to get in. You know, uh, this is risky. I will do the same. So <laughs> if you get involved and you do a lot of good work here, I'll work with Soul to get you a good recommendation letter. And if you want to be involved in myrmecology. I'd like to tell you, I think that will go a uh, fair ways. Um, and one of the things I care a lot about is helping the next generation of myrmecologists, especially in ways that I wasn't able to get assistance. Um, so I'm also <laughs> willing to do that. But again, that all comes back to that layer of professionalism that I was talking about earlier. Exactly. Okay. Uh, Laya Arun asks, um, should we look for in internships, and how important are they in getting into the profession? 
So one thing I'll say is that over the next couple of years, internships are going to be less and less important. Um, pretty much every internship program that was going to be active in 2020 has now been canceled yeah. or postponed indefinitely. And universities and programs completely understand that. But if you can show initiative in other ways, that's important too. I will say that internships, having one REU or a research experience for undergraduates is absolutely critical if you want to get into a great graduate school program. The good news is you have four or five years as an undergraduate to get into one of those programs and they often don't even fill up. Um, certain programs have a ton of competition. Other ones might surprise you that they don't. Like my internship at the Smithsonian, I know that I beat out other people, but it was still an incredibly accessible internship. It's something that you can do. <laughs> uh, and I think that's really exciting. Um, different universities have lots of different programs, uh, but I think internships shouldn't be seen as a barrier uh, and more of like a really useful opportunity. And internships will actually help you better understand the kind of entomologist, the kind of biologist, the kind of person that you want to be later on. Um, I've done a lot of political work and political internships as well, completely unrelated to ants, but where my expertise in biology, in science communication, even in ants, has been useful to furthering public policy. I wouldn't have had those opportunities had I not done an internships in entomology or on the flip side in politics so internships super useful but there's a caveat they're not absolutely critical and you should be aware that it's going to be diff more and more difficult to get into them right now because of all the cancellations that we've seen over this year hmm. okay so we're approaching the two-hour mark here we've got six or seven more questions um in the in the main AMA section, and then a whole bunch of general Q&A questions. Um, do you want to take like a 10 minute break and uh, we can come back to it? Yeah, let, let's take a 10 minute break. So come back here in 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, uh, for my uh, time in the Pacific, that would be 110 uh, Pacific. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, we can open up the, the AMA channel um, to anybody who wants to just kind of generally talk. Um, and we'll go back into things at uh, 110. See you guys then. Oh yeah, everybody can speak now. Um, you just yeah. have to you have to unmute yourself. Oh, that was dreadful me not talking. <laughs> this was amazing. Yeah, it's, it's really been great. Cool. I didn't know he did work with the space station. That's really freaking cool. Uh huh. And, uh, <coughs> is anybody having difficulty with getting unmuted? My audio keeps cutting in and out. That's uh, something with... Well, th we'll have the recording up as well. I'm not sure why the audio keeps cutting in and out. Um, we are a tier two server, so we do have a better streaming quality, or we should. Um, but I'm not sure why it's kind of happening the way it is. So, has the professionality in the server? How has that been in the recent like months? Um, you know, it's it's actually it's it's kind of a balancing act. Um, uh, we don't want to stifle people. Um, we want people to be able to kind of talk how they how they're going to. Um, but like, um. It's it it hasn't been great. So like we had the we had the 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 downtime um, in the winter, um, and we kind of let things loose a little bit, um, just so that we could get the activity up because we were hitting like what like three four thousand messages a day, um, which isn't good. Um, I mean it, it's it's like par for the course for winter, um, but f because we want to have everything come back strong in the spring, um, we do try to keep activity up in the winter. Um, so the, the maturity level then wasn't great. Um, but, uh, now that we're back up to like 13,000 messages a day, um, we're starting to come down a little bit harder on, um, uh, maturity. Um, and it's, it's, again, it's a balancing act. We don't want to like, we want you guys to be able to talk how you're going to. 
um, and like have fun and like, you know, but at the same time, really high quality conversation, um, like people sharing their DIY projects, um, and having, having, uh, like professional entomologists who we've got like a lot of now, um, be willing to jump in and kind of chat with everybody. Uh, it's again, it's a balancing act. Wow. All right. I, I hate the winter season because, um, chat's not that active and <laughs> for us in the Southern hemisphere. It's the most active season. Yeah, exactly. Um, now what we've been, what we've been doing is, um, uh, this year we actually, we brought up, uh, the Australia channel, um, and let everybody chat in it, um, because they were like doing all their anting and everything. Um, and I, I think we're going to keep doing that going forward. Um, just so that uh, I yeah. assumed you put it up cause they were on fire. Yeah. <laughs> you should try and do like a workshop or a presentation at the entomology conference. That would be cool. What about it? A, a oh. workshop or a... Or a yeah, so you know how you can submit symposia? Yeah. It would be cool if we submitted, like, how to keep insects or ants in general, like, yeah, and, uh, and how to kind of, like, merge the two hobbies together or something. <laughs> I actually, um, yeah, we put, in a, we put in a symposium proposal this year, um, but uh, the, the conference is kind of dead in the water, so... Um, but we did. We are we are putting in symposia uh, proposals, and we'll be doing it next year as well. Um, although the virus is probably still going to be going around by then. So anyway, we'll see how it goes. Um, I would. I just want to say, like, if you want to get a feel for what, um, yeah. like, entomology is and all that, um, Bugshot was amazing uh, for me. Um, uh, but going to the to the ESA conference was like mind blowing. Like, like four thousand entomologists all in one place, and there's literally conferences of people talking about things. Like at least like between three to five that I didn't want to miss, and they were all happening at the same time um, over like a three day period. It was insane. Like there was one talk that I went to there um, that like blew my mind. Um, uh, the it's it's there's actually studies coming out now um that ants um they they learn socially um so the older generation teaches new ants how to be ants and if you take an ant and put it in isolation um it won't learn those behaviors and it will be like antisocial um pun not intended <laughs> mm. um so I, I don't know, like, um, and like activity, like enrichment is important, um, for the development of ants. Um, so in, in a way that's, that's kind of like, it's, it's crazy. Like I'll, I'll try and find the study and link it later, but it's just, it's awesome. Is anybody else having trouble getting unmuted? Um, can everybody, is everybody able to talk? I thought we enabled it, but if you, oh, yeah, 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 you yeah, just listen, right, cool. it's just, yeah, as um, the helper said, if you're having trouble, then just leave and then rejoin. Yeah, yeah. Um, leave the channel and rejoin if you can't talk. So Nerbs is saying, uh, not all entomology or myrmecology has to be super stiff or in professional chat. I think it's 100% okay to joke and throw foul language at caltech our lab has a chat channel on staffy are active and active every day in our main ways of communication conversation is not at all professional we're all human mm. you know it's okay so so oh, man it's really difficult when when we take rules and considerations into when we take when we when we when we make rules in the first and this has to do with organizing a community like this um the goal is so that everybody who is everybody who's around is not going to participate in behavior that deters other people we want like the maximum amount of compatibility so when you talk about something like politics um 
or like drugs or whatever, you create two groups of people that can't um, that that can't stay in the same space anymore. Um, so that's that's ultimately what all of the rules on the server um, are driving towards. Yeah, exactly. Um, but um, and and so the, the the really tricky part here is. Um, the people who want to just kind of like uh, have a place to react, relax, and just kind of talk with everybody, um, those are really important people in the server because that makes up the the brunt of the ch of the chat that happens. Um, uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of people that like they don't they're not interested in that. They're they're more like they want to get down to brass tacks and talk uh, specifically about ants and. I mean the chat. The chat will move both ways, um, but it's it's difficult. We're we're still trying to figure it out. One of the things that we might do is um, and and uh, there's been push from the mod team, um, all, all the other people that uh, help with the decisions on the server. They, it is to um, bring back the adults channel, um, and um, because uh, it and I don't know if that's. It's 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 a difficult decision. I don't want to exclude anybody. That's the thing, um, but at the same time, it's it's difficult. No, we're not so, sure yeah. about bringing that back. Um, it's it's right. still under discussion, yeah, and I don't think it's a good idea personally. Um, but I do see that by not having it, we do edge a certain type of individual out of the community, um, and they no longer participate. Um, yeah better way to like uh say it more like a formal type of chat instead yeah you know, yeah compared to calling it like the adult chat ch channel because that sounds a bit condescending to people who aren't 18 plus you get what i mean yeah yeah no I, no i totally get what you're saying <laughs> and like some of the most so, enthusiastic people on the server are under 18 um and they can per perfectly capable of um engaging in like mature chat um but at the same like having a channel and labeling it like mature um don't think that's a good idea i do <laughs> no yeah <laughs> what you're saying is that you're Formal not gonna call it big boy chat no damn <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. We'll figure it out. It's it's. Just call up no jokes allowed. <laughs> mm -hmm. Grumpy All right. It's go. it's almost uh, it's almost been ten minutes, so we're probably gonna get back to the AMA in a second here. Yeah, fair enough. Ooh. So, can I give you a personal question? Yeah, what's up? Uh, do you have any any colonies yourself? <laughs> God damn it! I've been asked. I've been people have been asking me this a lot lately. Yes, I have a lot of colonies. I just I don't post up that often. Yeah. <laughs> I just saw the uh, picture a long time ago about the fine thingy. That's what I was wondering if you stopped because of that. The fine thingy? What? Uh, wasn't there a trade thingy? The story about the USDA radio oh. house, I think. It was. No, 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 that wasn't me. Um, that was uh, <laughs> who was that? R, right? Yeah, that was R. That wasn't me. Uh, no, no, I really don't know as much about you much as we'd like to. Like I think. Happened <laughs> so long ago, like two years now, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah. All right, just to let you know, guys, I'm back. I'm probably welcome. Oh, hey, um, I'm probably gonna be more publicly visible moving forward. Um, there's some projects that I want to work on, um, especially with the the AMA series. I have other people lined up, and I'm kind of aiming to maybe have these maybe once every other month or so. Um, and with that my name and all that other stuff is going to be out there in the ether. Um, so it'll, it'll, it'll be more, more public. Don't worry. I know it. 
<laughs> you, you can. I, um, let's see. How much should I charge? Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. Uh, so that's our ten minutes. Um, let's get back to it. Let's see. Um, Army of Insects asks, uh, "How do you know if someone will be a good mentor?" How do you know if someone will be a good mentor? Yeah. Yeah. Did I? Am I still so, cutting out? Uh, just a little bit, but I, I, that was, I got pretty much everything. Cool. Um, I see in the chat, before I even talk about that, NURBS mentioned, you know, not all entomology murmur should be super stiff and professional. I completely agree with that. Um, I just, what I want to talk about is, you know, the way that you present yourself to entomologists or in very public settings is what I'm referring to there. Uh, you want to make sure you're professional. Um, so back to your question, um, which is, remind me of the exact wording. Oh, sure. Um, how do you know if someone will be a good mentor? Or That's I guess right. he's also asking, like, how do you pick somebody to, because you, what you said earlier was you need to get involved with their research. Um, so it's, it's, it's a two way street. How do you go about um, deciding who you want to go with. Mm -hmm. So that's an excellent question. Uh, it's one of the great questions, I think, of business <laughs> professionals. Um, <laughs> there is no way to know if you've found a great mentor. There's a lot of ways to know if you have found not a good mentor. So you want to talk to the people who work with that person. Um, so, like, if there's a, maybe another student that has worked for him or her or been in their lab or whatever, you can ask them what their experience is like. That's a big, big deal. Uh, it's very common, too. You shouldn't feel bad about doing that. Um, the, the best professors and people to work with, if you're talking in, like, a formal mentorship setting, will tell you, here's some people in my lab. Feel free to reach out to them and ask them what it's like. Um, it's very common professionally in academia to reach out to people who work with someone that you're considering working with and see what they are like. So don't be afraid to do that. Um, you can also look at, does this person have a history of mentoring other people? Um, is this person friendly? Are they accepting? Uh, look on their Facebook. Um, if their Facebook is full of kind of hate-filled messaging or it's very political and you don't at all agree with their political ideas, that kind of thing. There are some red flags that you can pretty easily figure out uh, if there's somebody that you don't want to work with. Mm. That doesn't mean that it, you can't get into a position a year down the road where you're like, man, this just isn't working out. And that's where you have to have the courage to say, I just don't think this is right anymore. I need to move on. You need to move on to something like that. Um, it sounds like some construction just started outside of my house. <laughs> so I'm hoping that's not coming through the chat. If it does, I'm very, you know, I apologize for that. It's all um, right. I think I pretty much answered that as best I can. The problem with mentorship is that it's one of, I think, the most special interactions that you have in your life. It's one that's been a part of human stories for forever, um, is those relationships of mentorship. And that they can be intensely personal, and the things that you need help with, kind of mentorship you need, might be very different than what someone else needs. So it's all about kind of being true to yourself and identifying what areas maybe you are weaker in, or you don't have experience in, or you need help with, and finding someone who complements you in those areas. Hmm. Okay, Gooseman asks, um, I'm looking to stay in state, but I'm afraid there aren't many opportunities for careers involving entomology in my state. How would I find opportunities like that? Um, is Gooseman uh, willing to share what state they're in? Gooseman, but, yeah. Uh, so while you figure that out, I'll speak broadly and just say... Oh, he's in, um, he's in Ohio. Yeah. He's in Ohio. Oh, yeah. Ohio's got lots of entomology i wouldn't worry about that at all uh but i can understand that it might seem like there isn't that much going on um every state in the united states conducts entomological research they have to entomology is one of those essential fields of ecology and biology 
everywhere in the world except for Antarctica, there are lots of insect species playing absolutely critical ecological roles. Uh, in Antarctica, there is one species of insect, which is a midge. One of my ant research friends actually was there a couple weeks ago doing research on that before they got recalled. So <laughs> um, everywhere on Earth, entomology research happens. Now, there may not be lots of formal opportunities to do entomology work in certain states and certainly in certain areas of certain states. Um, but for the most part, it's fairly accessible. What I would encourage um, Gooseman and, and anyone in a state that, you know, if you have the impression there's not a lot going on there, um, reach out to that state's land grant university. And that's fairly easy to find. So land grant universities got their uh, land and basically their university ship from the government uh, through the Morrill Act. And that was, I think, President Lincoln. Um, and those universities are actually tasked with agricultural and life science research as one of their main founding goals. So they will have entomology uh, professors or, or at least professionals there. Um, and then if you get in touch with those people, they'll be able to point you to um, the entomology work uh, being done. You could also contact the Entomological Society of America, but that really isn't their main goal uh, or their main mission isn't necessarily to help a high school student find an entomologist, uh, but they may be able to assist you with that. Um, I think it's important to be patient as well. I receive a lot of emails from people interested in ants or entomology, and I can't always get back to them on the same day. And it's really discouraging when an hour after someone's messaged me, they message me again saying, hello, are you there? You know, entomologists are very busy people, just like most people are. Um, so having some respect there, I think, is really important because it's it's always hmm. suppressing to me when someone has no patience. Now, if it's been two weeks and they haven't gotten back to you, three weeks even, you can send another email and just say, hey. Uh, when you get a chance, can you take a look at this? That kind of thing. That's totally fine. But spamming anyone, that's the, the sort of stuff that's going to kind of send you backwards uh, rather than forwards. Mm. Uh, Gooseman also asks, uh, is there a way to have a career involving ants but not become a myrmecologist? I'm interested by what you said about Ray Mendez and his career. Um, that is a very unique case in which somebody built a career on knowledge of keeping insects alive and knowledge of marketing. Um, so yes, there are ways to pursue a career with, with ants or other insects, rather, and not become a myrmecologist. But quite frankly, that's difficult. Mm -hmm. One thing that, you know, I don't want to stifle anyone, but I there are a massive number of people who want to make ant farms. And many of those people don't recognize the amount of effort it takes, and they don't recognize the fact that it takes years of research and deep understanding of ant biology. You know, I think Mac from Tar Heel Ants is a great example of someone who has invested a ton into understanding the ants, their needs, into materials, into designing carrier. Um, and there's a lot of temptation right now because laser cutters or 3D printers are readily available to just like, oh, I'm going to be an ant store. But until you've really done the research, done the work, put in your years of ant keeping, usually those stores fail. Or if they don't fail, they should fail. Uh, and I'm not going to call anyone out, <laughs> but I will say that if you don't have a really deep understanding of, of not only ant keeping, but ant biology, then you should really focus on building that up rather than try to start a business selling 3D printed ant farms that are based on a, a loose understanding of what ants need. Mm -hmm. uh, Zod uh, like asks, uh, how much do you need to travel in this job? Do you have to travel long distances? Long distances. Um, I would rephrase that as how much do you get to travel because I love. <laughs> Um, but I understand some people don't or have family. There are different kinds of positions um, that offer very different levels of travel. 
I'm probably an extreme case in that I've been able to finagle a lot of travel opportunities, especially in the last two or three years. Um, but entomologists will travel outside of their city into other states, that kind of thing, uh, generally multiple times a year, uh, at least for the Entomological Society Conference. You may not attend that every single year, but most years you probably would. Um, and then you have uh, other reasons you might travel for professional development, for research. Obviously, going to Madagascar for research is a huge travel uh, situation. Um, I will say that the agricultural research entomologists do a lot of in-state travel. So if you are doing agricultural research entomology in Montana, chances are you're going to be driving around all the time. Um, but that doesn't necessarily translate if you're going to be an agricultural research entomologist. You know, if you're Miles, you're cutting research, out a little bit. Okay. Uh, just, I just think a second. It, it might be trying to kill the construction noise that just started again. Ah, okay. So that's the construction noise is not coming through at all. Um, yeah, so that, I that think it be maybe better. maybe it's trying to stop it and then cuts me out. Okay. No. Anyway, sorry, um, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's fine. Um, basically, I, I guess to wrap up that point, um, the travel stuff varies a lot. Uh, in different disciplines, different career levels. Um, and I think that's one area that I think you have a lot of autonomy in terms of what you choose to pursue as a career. Um, you can choose one that you know is going to involve a lot of travel or one that involves very little travel. Um, for me personally, I think travel is one of the great privileges of a career as a biologist. Um, it's something I absolutely look forward to and I look forward to doing as soon as possible. <laughs> Okay, this is the last uh, on-topic question we have here, um, and then we have um, some very general questions. Um, and I guess we can you can kind of pick and choose what you want to answer there. Um, Ant Friend says he is 15 years old and he is very interested in entomology. Uh, he's already looked into some studies that include entomology. Obviously, he can't take the classes now, uh, but what can he do to pre prepare for those studies? He is currently studying biotechnology. You cut out there. He's currently studying what? <laughs> I think it might be an issue on Discord's end. Okay. So he's 15 yeah. years old. Uh, so he says, I am 15 years old and I'm really interested in studying entomology. I've already looked into some studies that include entomology. Obviously, I can't take those classes now, but what can I do now to prepare for those studies? I am currently studying biotechnology. Biotechnology as a high schooler? Uh, I guess. Wow. Um, I come from a tiny town in Idaho that doesn't resource. It's uh, Idaho as a state doesn't do a lot of resourcing for education. It blows my mind what some of you kids are doing <laughs> right now in your high school classrooms. And congratulations on on that and taking advantage of those opportunities. Um, what I can tell you, if you are say fifteen, so that means you probably have two, three years of high school left, something like that. Um, the best things that you can do is, you know, do well in your courses, especially something like, you know, chemistry or environmental science, biology, that kind of thing. But you also should be involved in your community. And if you can, pursue opportunities uh, related to maybe just biology or natural history. So maybe there's a community project that cleans up a local park all the time, or there's a bio blitz going on. That kind of stuff, being involved in that really gives you good experience, and it looks great if you're trying to pursue a career in entomology. Um, there just are not a lot of really on-topic resources for entomology study in high school. Um, it's just mm -hmm. something that it, it just doesn't really exist. Uh, but one thing you can do is get like an entomology field guide. You can, you know, you can get entomology textbooks. I have great re uh, recommendations on those if you have any interest in those. Um, and I guess I'd close that out by saying, if you can, spend as much time as you can outside. Go be in nature. Um, my understanding of ant biology is as based on my keeping of hun probably 100 ant species as it is on actually just watching ants and being around the natural world itself. Um, 
as much as I can. And that's a, that's a passion of mine, but it also has been invaluable in terms of becoming a biologist. Uh, and the naturalists, the people who do a lot of work outside, have some really special kind of gifts and understandings of the world. And it's one of those things that you actually can teach yourself. You don't have to be born with some special skill in this area. You have to invest time outside. And that's really what it takes to become a great field biologist. I just want to add to that. Um, if you're younger um, and you have limited opportunities because you can't drive and all that, um, doing what you're doing on the server, um, fostering a passion early on, um, and um, teaching yourself like identification, um, how to take good macro fo photos, um, uh, and um, starting conversations um, with people that are either like college students or um, uh, and just and just um, building a, a basic knowledge purely based like of what you're interested in um, is a I feel like that goes a long way um, towards uh, like uh, keeping um, keeping going with this um, and, I, I, and building I it into agree with that. Um, yeah and one thing that you can do to be a really valuable member of the community is when you log on ask someone how they're, they're doing or ask what they are doing or um, because one thing that I've seen a lot in online communities is people will log on and say, I have this problem. Here's my question. Fix it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or here's my ant colony. I don't care what you're doing. And if we want to build a really good community here, um, it's, it's really helpful to actually invest and engage with kind of your fellow hobbyists, your fellow community members. Yeah. Okay, there's one last question, um, kind of tacked on at the end. Uh, what are good secondary qualifications like PPE safety or uh, driver's license? Mm, good question. Uh, wilderness survival courses, wilderness uh, medical uh, first aid kind of training stuff is great. CPR, that sort of thing. Um, let's see. Any, any sort of, if you want to go into field work, any sort of field work kind of qualification stuff, I'm trained in how to navigate volcanic areas because of my work in Yellowstone. That kind of thing is really useful. Um, but even leadership training, actually, I would say is a really big, uh, a really useful thing. Um, I used to teach a leadership course that was like super successful. It, all of your life experiences come together to make you who you are. And there's no perfect cookie cutter mold to become whatever you want to become. And I guarantee you that even if you're working towards a certain goal and you want to do something, uh, be a certain kind of ant scientist when you're 45 years old, things will change along the way. And the way in which you react to changing conditions, changes, changes in plans, those have a big influence on your character and also what you're able to do mm -hmm. with your career. Okay, um, I guess we can move into the more general questions. There is one more here um, because you mentioned that you had books um, that you would recommend um, younger people read. Um, what do you want to go into that? Um, like what what you would recommend people start reading, and um, where to start with uh, research and uh, building knowledge uh, for myrmecology, entomology, ecology, etc. Yeah, um, that's it's <laughs> kind of a complicated question, but I yeah. will say uh, one of the best things that you can do if you want to be an ant researcher would be to get the Fisher Guide to Ant Genera uh, of North America. It's a field guide, um, and that can be pretty useful for for people starting out. Um, I really enjoyed reading The Ants by Wilson and Holdobler, but that book sometimes goes for hundreds and hundreds of dollars. <laughs> very difficult to get. So I'm not telling you that you need to go get that book. But learning from the people who do the kind of work that you're interested in is really useful. So you can read the journal articles they publish. Sometimes it's really complicated and not something that you can, you can do. Uh, 
on that note, I will say there's a lot of journal articles out there, even on ants, that I can read three times and not understand it because I don't have the background in certain areas like phylogenetics. So if you're finding things that you're like, wow, I don't understand this, that's great. In fact, that's a good thing that you're exposing yourself to things you don't understand uh, because it gives you new learning opportunities. Um, other books, I would say, I think it's, let me, let me just double check on Google really quick. I've got one great just entomology book uh, that I can recommend. It's a textbook. It's probably what you would use in almost any introductory entomology course, and that's The Study of Insects. I'm posting it in the voice chat, but it's by Norman F. Johnson and Charles A. Triplehorn. Entomologists pretty much always just refer to it as Triplehorn. <laughs> um, but it's uh, the introduction to the study of insects. Uh, and you can get this book used for about $106, and you can also rent it for like 50 bucks. Uh, and those rentals are usually like five month long or that kind of thing. So you could get a hold of that, read through some of the chapters. That's a great way to like really dramatically increase your knowledge of entomology as a whole. Um, one of the great things about ants is that there's a lot of information that isn't in book form. So you can watch videos, you can watch documentaries, you can watch the ant hour, of course. Um, <laughs> there's lots of different ways to kind of learn about ants and other insects. Um, and that isn't true for every uh, areas. Every area of insects doesn't have those kinds of resources. Ants are one of the best reported on groups. Um, and that means that we have access to a lot of great resources that other entomologists even don't have access to. Again, like AntWeb. Cool. Um, I can, if people have specific needs, I can absolutely request, uh, uh, recommend different books, but I don't want to spam the chat with tons of different books that may be not mm. uh, interesting to most people. Okay. All right. We've been going for two and a half hours. I think this is our longest AMA. I was expecting it to be like, <laughs> maybe an hour and a half. Um, we do have a lot of general Q&A questions. Uh, do you want to answer those uh, over voice or would you, uh, we could stop here and you can just answer in text form if you'd prefer. Um, I, I don't no, want to keep I, you for too long. Yeah, I like doing, I like doing the voice. So let's continue doing that a little bit more. Um, <laughs> okay. I feel like I'm able to answer more questions more thoroughly that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, let's go. I, I used to do radio, so, um, uh, you know, this isn't terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so to close out, I guess, and I just saw this, um, the, the main section, um, what are the three biggest tips you would say uh, for starting out in Mermacol? You're, uh, you're, you're cutting out again. I'm sorry. No worries. Three biggest tips? Um, yeah, three biggest tips for starting out in uh, Mermacology. Uh, yeah, in, in Mermacology. Sure. So the three biggest tips that I have, like, number one, um, be an open-minded learner. Challenge your assumptions, challenge the things that you think you know about ants and the natural world. Um, because being able to think critically and also admit that you're wrong is really, really important in science and it's important in myrmecology as well. Uh, number two, I would say spend time on task. Um, again, we were talking about being outside if you can be, uh, identifying insects if you can, practicing photography. Um, there's a lot of these people will, who will talk about how it takes like 10,000 hours to master a skill or whatever. Well, ant research is a little different than that. But the more time that you put into doing things, the more you will really understand, I guess ant biology from um, kind of in, in your gut, basically. Because I can look at what an ant is doing pretty much anywhere and have a good idea of what that ant is doing and probably why. And that doesn't come from reading a whole bunch. That comes from actually watching the ants, being around them, applying my knowledge to what I actually see in the world. And then uh, there's a, you know, you asked for a third one. The third one would really be don't let it completely consume you. Don't let your quest to be a myrmecologist consume you. 
Don't let, um, you know, your interest in ants absolutely be the only aspect of who you are as a person. Don't push out your relationships, your other people um, in your life to become super, super obsessed on this topic. And that's a, a mistake that, that I made at one point, I think pretty much during high school, where I became so hyper-focused on ants that I started missing kind of what was around me. And when I pulled back, did some more community service, got involved with my family, that actually led me to do better work professionally. Um, so yeah. knowing to maintain that balance helps you have kind of a better career experience, I think. Hmm. Okay, getting into the general Q&A section, um, uh, it's it's a whole like kind of hodgepodge of uh, questions. Yeah, that's and fine. Uh, <laughs> I guess we can kind of open this up um, if people want to ask like directly. Um, we can have it be a, a less formal kind of thing. So if you guys are in the AMA channel, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up to everybody. You need to have your thing set to push to talk um, and um, try and talk in turn, essentially. I guess Miles or myself uh, will call on you, um, but I'll open it up and it'll be a little bit, a little bit more casual here. Um, so just a second. I sound like a car engine. Okay, everybody can talk now. Um, if you're having trouble speaking here, uh, you should um, leave the channel and come back, and it should let you. Okay, so uh, Halalifer asks, um, how much nutrition do the ants actually get from a mealworm fruit fly diet, um, and how beneficial is it to vary the diet more? Whoa, uh, that's a, uh, so nutritional work with ants is really complicated and very poorly understood. So I will give you my opinion, but this shouldn't be taken as scientific fact, uh, because we just don't have great understanding. Um, it's really important in my experience to vary the diets of the ants that you keep that don't have a specialized diet. In other words, that are not leaf cutter ants that need certain kinds of plants to feed their fungus, that are not seed harvesting ants that really only need to eat seeds. We're talking about the generalists. You know, you got the formica, the laceus, the campanotus, um, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Those I highly recommend um, altering, alternating rather, uh, mealworms and flightless fruit flies in their diets along with uh, different fruits, sugar water. I use honey water. There are different um, opinions about using honey with ants. I think that it's a beneficial thing. I think the proteins present in honey can be a beneficial thing. Again, it's really frustrating to answer these kinds of questions. Not, not, I'm not at all frustrated by the question <laughs> itself. It's frustrating because we do not have a very good understanding. Mm. Um, what kind of ratio of do you use ant nutrition? for your honey water? Um, that's a great question. I use about uh, one part honey to three or four parts water. You actually want it to be a lot more watered down than a lot of people expect um, because that better mimics the uh, kind of sugar content of the foods that ants would get in the environment like honeydew, for example, or uh, nectar from a plant. Cool. Um, oh, Army of Insects asks... Um... And I guess this is on topic, actually. Um, what about like foreign foreign languages? Um, does that play a, like what 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 other languages are important in terms of entomology? Um, and what do you think people should study? <coughs> I muted him. Yeah. <laughs> um. See. Uh. Let's say. Um. Foreign language is often a requirement of higher education nowadays. It doesn't really going into. Um, at my university, to graduate with honors, you are required to have taken a second language for two years. Yep. But in terms of actually being a myrmecologist, it can be very useful to know different languages. I think the most useful language um, for field work is generally Spanish. Um, because there's a lot of ant research that is conducted in Central and South America. Um, 
you also see French quite a bit. So like Madagascar, a lot of African countries were colonized by the French. Uh, so the French is very prevalent in that area of the world. Huh. What I will say is that if you're able to do it, one of the, if not the most useful languages in the 21st century would be Chinese Mandarin. Um, and that's a, something that I wish I had had the opportunity to study. I think Army of Insects figured out what's going on with the Ants of the Southwest. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I guess uh, um, um, Salalan has a vague question. Uh, he's hit a, a, a hard note. What is the best way to motivate yourself, as in going to uni, etc.? That's interesting. I think my <laughs> motivations as a, as a human are maybe more romantic than most people. I genuinely want to use my life to be someone who does good in the world and helps people. Yep. And I try and balance my personal interest in ants with the broader mission of making progress on something like climate change, biodiversity loss. And I, my personal motivations are going to be different than yours, but those broad motivations for your life. Um, can be broken down into smaller goals. And if you can identify the different goals that you have a period of six months or a year, that can really help you. Like, if you asked me one of my goals four years ago, it would be to be the president of the United States. Now, is that something that's going to get me up in the morning every morning? Absolutely not. Okay. But the idea behind that is helping as many people as you possibly can. Okay, that's a goal that you can internalize and then use throughout your life. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with the ants. Maybe you want to help us make progress on climate change, or maybe you want to help conserve habitats. Well, if you are able to not lose sight of how your work as an entomologist helps do that, it's, not, it's really not that difficult to be motivated. I do want to say at the end of this message, I have days where I'm absolutely not motivated. You know, there, there's all these influencers on, online, you know, watch a Casey Neistat video and you're like, wow, he's so motivated to do something every day. And that's really not how the human experience works. So it's important to know that everybody's human. Everybody has challenges um, and everyone's situation is different. Um, but it has been useful for me to look at the big ideas I have, the big things I want to accomplish, and then break down kind of the steps to getting there. Yeah, and that's that's a lot of how I motivate myself as well. Um, what I, I guess there's kind of three things that I look at personally is um, uh, significance of the work that I'm doing, um, like how things, how, like what the, what the reach of what I'm doing is going to be the impact. Um, so like if I'm trying to figure out like uh who's like who, like somebody's messing up the the hand keeping server like one person is doing whatever um that in a nutshell isn't important to me um like if one person but when you step back and look at the significance the ant keeping server itself has significance for further goals so and making sure that there isn't one or two people that can just ruin the server is important for the health of the server itself that's when i when i don't want to be doing something like handling whatever on the server that's how i get myself going there um the other thing is um purpose um finding what and, and that's like very broad, um, but um, like meaning in the work of what you're doing, um, helping people um, in the long run, um, uh, bringing joy to others. Um, and uh, last thing from one of my favorite books of all time um, is to, um, when you do get started, um, uh, begin with the end in mind. So when nobody's going to live forever when you when people are if you imagine yourself at your own funeral and you're looking down at your own casket um what 
what do you want to be able to say about yourself? What do you want other people to be saying about you? Um, and just keep that in mind. Um, just my own personal tips. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that kind of got heavy. Uh, <laughs> so, um, the, I only, I only have a few more minutes here. Um, so let's kind of go rapid fire here. Um, Sounds good. Okay, uh, Miles, uh, are there opp- there are there are opportunities for insects and scouts? I was unaware of anything except for the insect study merit badge. I'm actually not super fluent on that. I've just heard from a lot of people who have been in scouts who have had quite a bit of entomology experience. I think that is probably um, dependent on. I think they call them troops or whatever. Yeah, yeah. I think it depends on different troops and and what the uh, adults do. Uh, how do you pronounce vicinus? <laughs> huh. So that's interesting. I made a, a video about Campanus vicinus a couple of years ago, and it got so <laughs> many questions. They're like, is that how you pronounce them? So I went to a systematist, and he's like, yeah, that's how I would pronounce it, but there's a different way. So one thing that's important for you guys to know is that Latin is dead. It's a language we don't necessarily understand. There are certain rules that can help you, but there is no perfect right answer. Um, Some people will say formica. I say formica. Some people will say formica. I don't do that. There's a lot of variation. (laughs) Uh, As a student of entomology, something that stressed me out was not knowing how to pronounce uh, Latin names. Mm -hmm. And guess what? It doesn't matter that much. And if someone really is going to be a jerk to you about it, they're not really worth your time anyway. Yeah, there is one thing that um, I see in the ant keeping hobby um, is uh, any any Latin name that ends in I is based on a scientist or almost all of them are based on a scientist. So like um, Heidei or uh, Pergandii. Um, Wheelerai. Wheelerai. You you don't say you don't say it like the E I in English um, like A. Like pergande, um, you you add the i at the end to the end of the person's name, um, and that that surprised me because it's um, weird. <laughs> I actually went on a Latin forum once and um, asked them exactly this, and they said, you know, the way they pronounce things in science is different from how they pronounce things in um, how Latin scholars pronounce things. So <laughs> anyway. I pronounce uh, it Fidoli. Yeah. Uh, well, okay. Is fi- <laughs> I just saw that in the chat. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, what would you say is the best ant preservation method? Ah, so I actually looked into this. I think Army of Insects sent me or sent uh, put a message there. So I reached out to somebody who does genetic work in anticipation of this question. Um, And I'm just going to pull up that email now. Yep. So I I can start answering this before the email is in. Um, The preserving insects for pinning is very different than preserving insects for genetic analysis. So here's what he had to say. Ethanol is slightly better than uh, any other preservation method, but isopropyl should work just fine. Uh, if you want to do um, genetic work, uh, that's at 95%. That is not 70%. Okay, we're talking 95% ethanol or propyl alcohol. Um, it is made even better if it's stored in 20, in negative 20 degrees C. That's a freezer, a regular freezer in the short term, or a negative uh, 80 degrees C <laughs> freezer in the long term. I so, didn't catch you that way. Okay. Um, If you want to preserve insects for genetic work, ethanol is the best at 95%, but you could also use isopropyl alcohol. Um, It also needs to be above 90%. If you want to do genetic analysis, you need to store it in the freezer, and ideally it would be in a negative 80 degrees Celsius freezer. That's Mm -hmm. a research-grade freezer but a negative 20 is still pretty good. Okay. Uh, 
Goose asks, probably a stupid question, but why is it that scientists always seem to be wearing long sleeve button ups in the field? Doesn't that seem like it'd be best for working in those conditions to me? So one thing that's important to know is that biologists, first and foremost, their most important priority is always looking good. Um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so that's an interesting question. It's one I definitely had at that age too. Um, it's actually one of the more practical things to wear. And if you're doing field research for a long time, you're exposed to a lot of sunlight and you want to make sure you're protecting yourself. So that's one way that researchers protect themselves is literally by wearing long sleeve shirts. It's also great because if you do get hot, you can roll up the sleeves. Um, they're modular. You can open up buttons, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. I don't, th I don't think that they are necessarily worn because scientists have decided that is the very best thing to wear. I think it's because scientists don't think about what they wear that much. And a professor or a research scientist usually wears a button-down shirt. <laughs> and that translates over <laughs> to field research. Uh -huh. uh, but there are benefits to doing that. If you watch me uh, on, on my videos, I wear polo shirts, okay? Uh, Button-down polo shirts. Um, people, to each their own, quite honestly. You do what works for you. Fair enough. Uh, Milta asks, in Madagascar, did you encounter driver ants? And if so, did they live up to all the hype? I did not encounter driver ants. And when I was in South <laughs> Africa, uh, I've been there twice in the last six, no, not six, eight months, I don't know, something like that, past year. Um, I was really hoping to run into them. Didn't, even though uh, some villagers told me they saw some in an area uh, a day before. And I was like, no! <laughs> uh, but you still find lots of really phenomenal ants. And if you watch our videos, we did encounter Mystrium, which are the Snapjaw ants. Adrian Smith from Ant Lab has great videos on them. Uh, in addition to, to what cool. we did. There's so many awesome ants out there. Okay. Um, how do you study ants' behavior for a species you know that isn't studied? For a species you know that isn't what? Studied. Studied. Sorry, I guess it comes Oh, that's an interesting question. That's sort of like the, the question on how do you keep an ant that uh, other people aren't, aren't keeping or you've never kept. Uh, you want to learn about the. Just a second. Want to learn about the. Who's going? I fixed it. Okay. You want to learn about uh, the the related ants, and if you can't do that, you still want to. <laughs> that was quite interesting. Uh, <laughs> you you still want to kind of characterize the ant into whatever categories that you can, which would be yeah. you know, is it fully claustral, semi claustral, that sort of process. Hmm. Uh, what process do you go? through after thinking you've discovered a new species of ant? Hmm. That's an interesting question. And yes, Ogre, you are redeemed. You sound like a car. Um, <laughs> that's a really difficult question to answer um, because those processes are different in different places. Um, if you find that if you think you truly have a new species of ant, the best thing to do would be figure out which myrmecologist uh, has worked with that genus before or in that area and contacting them and saying, hey, I think I might have a new record. Um, they're probably the ones to, to be the most help. Um, but it, it's kind of a messy science, <laughs> quite honestly. Uh, Army of Insects asks, will entomology be more valuable if more people get into it? That's a hard thing because I'm encouraging you guys to follow your dreams, but at the same time, we've got to be honest. There's a lot of people who want to study ants. Um, mm. And if there's a ton of demand for something, you might think, oh, then there will be more supply made. And that's not the way the world works, mm. um, at least not in this context. Yeah. Um, so if everyone becomes an entomologist, the value of an entomologist singular goes down because mm. there's more. That, that being sense. said, we need more entomologists, right? And we, the challenges that we face, uh, in the United States and around the world are more and more defined by our relationship with the environment. Mm. And there are very few people who understand the environment better or in more useful ways than entomologists do. Mm. Army of Insects also asks, uh, what is the best way to collect and observe wild colonies? Do you have a video on this, actually? Collect and observe. Yeah, Those wild... are two very different things. 
I guess collect to observe. I'm I'm guessing. Maybe he can clarify. Hopefully. Um, well, I have ant colony collection covered in many different videos. Mm -hmm. You'll see that a lot more this season as well. Um, you, you need to understand the ant species you're dealing with as best you can. The number one mistake that's made when collecting an ant colony isn't actually the process of collecting them. It's what happens afterward. Um, if you don't have a formicarium ready for those ants, it is absolutely irresponsible of you to collect them. Mm. Uh, if you don't know if those ants will secrete formic acid, for example, and gas themselves in a little vial, you need to. You need to be aware of that. Uh, with Pogon or Myrmex, you have issues with them accidentally stinging their queen in defense. So there's lots of different facets to collecting ants. And the best way to do it well, aside from just like specific techniques, is to actually understand those ants and how their behavior will be affected by collecting them. Mm. Um, I use an aspirator. I have a great tutorial. I mean, I think it's a tutorial, I should say. It is great. Uh, on, on yeah, it's what, it's what we link everybody. It's great. Uh, I appreciate that. <laughs> um, and aspirators are your best friend uh, for colony collection. And frankly, if you are collecting an ant colony that an aspirator won't work for, you're probably collecting a too large of a colony. Uh, mm. An exception to that would be like Campanotus if they don't fit in the aspirator. But I'm just saying, if you can't collect a colony in 30 minutes to an hour with an aspirator and maybe a trowel, you've probably bit off more than you can chew. Mm. Uh, Army of Insects also asks, uh, where are you researching ants right now, Montana? And I have to yes. be right back just a second. I think there's only, there's one question, there's two more questions after that, if somebody can help them with that, I have to be right back. Okay. Um, yes, I currently research ants uh, at Montana State University, and I'm a federal contractor for the U.S. government and the National Park Service. So my research right now is focused on the ants of Yellowstone National Park. Okay, I'm back. So uh, did you get the other questions? Um, oh, no, I didn't. Okay. Halalifer asks, uh, what preservation method works for reducing color loss? Um, as in keeping the green and in leaf insects. Mm, that's interesting. I don't know very much about non-ant preservation. Um, but the most critical thing to do is to dry those insects out kind of as quickly as you can. The longer that moisture sits within an insect that's being preserved, the, the more damage that's sort of done to it. Mm. Uh, another thing is that UV exposure will uh, cause colors to fade over time. So you want to make sure that they're dark or not exposed to UV, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I will also say that 70% ethanol is what you should be using for ants if they're not for genetic analysis. 95% uh, ethanol may distort colors. Um, it can cause structural damage over time. Um, but that is the way that you can best preserve an ant for DNA. Um, mm. because basically what happens is the higher ethanol percentage will draw the water out of the specimen and replace it with the alcohol faster. So the faster that happens, the better the preservation, except it can make specimens not look as good and it can also make them more brittle. Um, mm. So you really only want to do that with genetic analysis. And uh, I guess the last question um, is, is there, a, is there a most memorable moment that you've encountered during field research? most memorable moment that's hard i can't tell you that there's one most memorable moment i can talk about a couple quick sure um the first one would be my most recent trip to south africa where i was working with pangolins that were being rehabilitated after being taken out of the wild and i was there um partially just as a conservationist and a biologist but also for my knowledge in ants and i got to spend time with these pangolins out in the wild and kind of document and learn which ant species they forage on, um, how they dig up ant colonies, that kind of thing. And that was one of the most special experiences I've ever had. I mean, I almost get emotional thinking about it because penguins <laughs> are so threatened 
and the fact that a penguin's job is to find ants and that's my job yeah. too so there's this awesome camaraderie there <laughs> awesome. to, to do it I, I called them my colleague um <laughs> One thing I think probably the most excited I've ever been in terms of ants would be at the Ants of the Southwest course when we were excavating a honeypot ant colony and I had been going at it for about two and a half hours uh, and we got the queen. Damn. Um, and that was really exciting. The last one would be in Madagascar. I, I found the first mysterium ant, the snapshot ant yeah. uh, on the trip. And that had been one of our goals, and it was just so exciting for us to find them because after a week of trying, we had found nothing. Um, so that was really exciting. Awesome, really awesome. Okay, I think that's I think that's everything. That's about three hours even. Um, wow, <laughs> I actually I really thought it was only going to be like an hour and a half or so. Um, thanks so much, Miles, um, for for doing this, and it it really means a lot, to, especially to um, the younger people in the Discord. Um, they it, it, it feels like an unapproachable topic for a lot of them. Um, and I feel like what you've done today is really kind of broken down the barriers and um, shown that it's th there is a path for anybody who's willing to put in the work. Absolutely. I mean, I am so glad that this is a community that exists, especially one that's open to those people who are interested in career in myrmecology. And, you know, I said it earlier in the talk, but just there was nothing like this when I was trying to figure <laughs> this out. And I'm still trying to figure it out. Um, so I think it's really valuable. And I'm glad that I had the opportunity to kind of give back to that. Okay. All right. Well, I guess that's it. Um, I'm going to stop the recording here. And um, yeah. All right.